Recorded Books Incorporated presents an unabridged recording of Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. Narrated by Mark Hammer. This work is copyrighted 1937 by John Steinbeck. This recording is copyrighted 1999 by Recorded Books Incorporated. Born in Salinas, California in 1902, John Steinbeck grew up in one of the most fertile valleys in the state, an area that became the setting for much of his greatest fiction. In the fifty years prior to the publication of Of Mice and Men, much of the region's wheat and fruit crops were picked by migrant workers who followed the harvests, mostly single men without home or family, with a knapsack and a bedroll as their only possessions. Steinbeck himself had worked the fields and packing plants as a high school student, and after leaving Stanford University, where he only half-heartedly pursued his studies, he joined the ranks of the migrants, moving from ranch to ranch for nearly two years, experiencing firsthand the loneliness and isolation of the itinerant working man. In 1935, Many years after his laboring days, and more than a dozen after he had begun to scratch out a living as a writer, John Steinbeck published his first major success, Tortilla Flat, at the age of thirty-three. It was quickly followed by In Dubious Battle, a bestseller as well. When Tortilla Flat sold to the movies for the fabulous sum of four thousand dollars, Steinbeck found himself for the first time in a position of financial security. In this new-found state of artistic independence, he began work on a novel that he originally titled Something That Happened. It was published in 1937 as Of Mice and Men. The title is taken from a Robert Burns poem. And now, Of Mice and Men. A few miles south of Soledad, the Salinas River drops in close to the hillside bank and runs deep and green. The water is warm, too, for it has slipped twinkling over the yellow sands in the sunlight before reaching the narrow pool. On one side of the river, the golden foothill slopes curve up to the strong and rocky Gabilan Mountains, but on the valley side the water is lined with trees. Willows, fresh and green with every spring, carrying in their lower leaf junctures the debris of the winter's flooding, and sycamores with mottled white recumbent limbs and branches that arch over the pool. On the sandy bank under the trees, the leaves lie deep and so crisp that a lizard makes a great skittering if he runs among them. Rabbits come out of the brush to sit on the sand in the evening, and the damp flats are covered with the night tracks of coons and with the spread pads of dogs from the ranches and with the split wedge tracks of deer that come to drink in the dark. There's a path through the willows and among the sycamores, a path beaten hard by boys coming down from the ranches to swim in the deep pool and beaten hard by tramps who come wearily down from the highway in the evening to jungle up near water. In front of the low horizontal limb of a giant sycamore, there's an ash pile made by many fires. The limb is worn smooth by men who have sat on it. Evening of a hot day started the little wind to moving among the leaves. The shade climbed up the hills toward the top. On the sandbanks the rabbits sat as quietly as little gray sculptured stones. And then, from the direction of the state highway, came the sound of footsteps on crisp sycamore leaves. The rabbits hurried noiselessly for cover. A stilted heron labored up into the air and pounded down river. For a moment the place was lifeless. And then... Two men emerged from the path and came into the opening by the green pool. They had walked in single file down the path, and even in the open one stayed behind the other. Both were dressed in denim trousers and in denim coats with brass buttons. Both wore black, shapeless hats, 
and both carried tight blanket rolls slung over their shoulders. The first man was small and quick, dark of face, with restless eyes and sharp, strong features. Every part of him was defined, small, strong hands, slender arms, a thin and bony nose. Behind him walked his opposite, a huge man, shapeless of face, with large, pale eyes, with wide, sloping shoulders, and he walked heavily, dragging his feet a little, the way a bear drags his paws. His arms didn't swing at his sides, but hung loosely. The first man stopped short in the clearing, and the follower nearly ran over him. He took off his hat and wiped the sweatband with his forefinger and snapped the moisture off. His huge companion dropped his blankets and flung himself down and drank from the surface of the green pool, drank with long gulps, snorting into the water like a horse. The small man stepped nervously beside him. Lenny, he said sharply. Lenny, for God's sake, don't drink so much. Lenny continued to snort into the pool. The small man leaned over and shook him by the shoulder. Lenny, you're going to be sick like you was last night. Lenny dipped his whole head under, hat and all, and then he sat up on the bank and his hat dripped down on his blue coat and ran down his back. That's good, he said. You drink some, George. You take a good big drink. He smiled happily. George unslung his bindle and dropped it gently on the bank. I ain't sure it's good water, he said. Looks kind of scummy. Lenny dabbled his big paw in the water and wiggled his fingers so the water arose in little splashes. Rings widened across the pool to the other side and came back again. Lenny watched them go. Look, George, look what I've done. George knelt beside the pool and drank from his hand with quick scoops. Tastes all right, he admitted. Don't really seem to be running, though. You never ought to drink water when it ain't running, Lenny, he said hopelessly. You'd drink out of a gutter if you was thirsty. He threw a scoop of water into his face and rubbed it about with his hand under his chin and around the back of his neck. Then he replaced his hat, pushed himself back from the river, drew up his knees, and embraced them. Lenny, who had been watching, imitated George exactly. He pushed himself back, drew up his knees, embraced them, looked over to George to see whether he had it just right. He pulled his hat down a little more over his eyes, the way George's hat was. George stared morosely at the water. The rims of his eyes were red with sun glare. He said angrily, We could just as well have rode clear to the ranch if that bastard bus driver knew what he was talking about. Just a little stretch down the highway, he says. Just a little stretch. Got him near four miles, that's what it was. Didn't want to stop at the ranch gate, that's what. Too goddamn lazy to pull up. Wonder he isn't too damn good to stop in the soul of dad at all. Kicks us out and says, just a little stretch down the road. I bet it was more than four miles. Damn hot day. Lenny looked timidly over to him. George? Yeah, what do you want? Where are we going, George? The little man jerked down the brim of his hat and scowled over at Lenny. So you forgot that already, did you? I gotta tell you again, do I? Jesus Christ, you're a crazy bastard. I forgot, Lenny said softly. I tried not to forget. Honest to God, I did, George. Okay, okay. I'll tell you again. I ain't got nothing to do. Might just as well spend all my time telling you things, and then you forget them, and I tell you again. Tried and tried, said Lenny, but it didn't do no good. I remember about the rabbits, George. The hell with the rabbits. That's all you ever can remember is them rabbits. 
Okay. Now you listen, and this time you got to remember so we don't get in no trouble. You remember sitting in that gutter on Howard Street and watching that blackboard? Lenny's face broke into a delighted smile. Well, sure, George, I remember that. But what'd we do then? I remember some girls come by, and you says, uh, you say, to hell with what I says. You remember about us going into Murray and Reddy's, and they give us work cards and bus tickets. Oh, sure, George, I remember that now. His hands went quickly into his side coat pockets. He said gently, George, I ain't got mine. I must have lost it. He looked down at the ground in despair. You never had none, you crazy bastard. I got both of them here. Think I'd let you carry your own work card? Lenny grinned with relief. I, I thought I put it in my side pocket. His hand went into the pocket again. George looked sharply at him. What'd you take out of that pocket? I ain't a thing in my pocket, Lenny said cleverly. I know there ain't. You got it in your hand. What you got in your hand, hiding it? I ain't got nothing, George. Honest. Come on, give it here. Lenny held his closed hand away from George's direction. It's only a mouse, George. A mouse? A live mouse? Uh-uh. Just a dead mouse, George. I didn't kill it. Honest, I found it. I found it dead. Give it here, said George. Oh, let me have it, George. Give it here. Lenny's closed hand slowly obeyed. George took the mouse and threw it across the pool to the other side among the brush. What do you want of a dead mouse anyways? Why, I could pet it with my thumb while we walked along, said Lenny. Well, you ain't petting no mice while you walk with me. You remember where we're going now? Lenny looked startled, and then in embarrassment hid his face against his knees. I forgot again. Jesus Christ, George said resignedly. Well, look, we're going to work on a ranch like the one we come from up north. Up north? In weed. Oh, sure, I remember. In weed. That ranch we're going to is right down there about a quarter mile. We're going to go in and see the boss. Now look, I'll give him the work tickets, but you ain't going to say a word. You just stand there and don't say nothing. If he finds out what a crazy bastard you are, we won't get no job. But if he sees you work before he hears you talk, we're set. You got that? Sure, George. Sure, I got it. Okay. Now, when we go in to see the boss, what are you going to do? I, um, I, Lenny thought. His face grew tight with thought. I ain't gonna say nothing, just gonna stand there. Good boy. That's swell. You say that over two, three times so you're sure you won't forget it. Lenny droned to himself softly. I ain't gonna say nothing. I ain't gonna say nothing. I ain't gonna say nothing. Okay, said George, and you ain't gonna do no bad things like you done in weed, neither. Lenny looked puzzled. Like I done in weed? Oh, so you forgot that too, did you? Well, I ain't gonna remind you, fear you do it again. A light of understanding broke on Lenny's face. They run us out of weed, he exploded triumphantly. Run us out hell, said George disgustedly. We run. They was looking for us, but they didn't catch us. 
Lenny giggled happily. I didn't forget that, you bet. George lay back on the sand and crossed his hands under his head, and Lenny imitated him, raising his head to see whether he were doing it right. God, you're in a lot of trouble, said George. I could get along so easy and so nice if I didn't have you on my tail. I could live so easy and maybe have a girl. For a moment, Lenny lay quiet, and then he said, hopefully, We gonna work on a ranch, George? All right, you got that. But we're gonna sleep here because I got a reason. The day was going fast now. Only the tops of the Gabalon Mountains flamed with the light of the sun that had gone from the valley. A water snake slipped along on the pool, its head held up like a little periscope. The reeds jerked slightly in the current. Far off toward the highway, a man shouted something, and another man shouted back. The sycamore limbs rustled under a little wind that died immediately. George, why ain't we going on to the ranch and get some supper? They got supper at the ranch. George rolled on his side. No reason at all for you. I like it here. Tomorrow we're going to go to work. I seen thrashing machines on the way down. That means we'll be bucking grain bags, busting a gut. Tonight I'm going to lay right here and look up. I like it. Lenny got up on his knees and looked down at George. Ain't we going to have no supper? Sure we are. If you gather up some dead willow sticks, I got three cans of beans in my bindle. If you get a fire ready, I'll give you a match when you get the sticks together, and we'll heat the beans and have supper. Lenny said, I like beans with ketchup. Well, we ain't got no ketchup. You go get wood, and don't you fool around. It'll be dark before long. Lenny lumbered to his feet and disappeared in the brush. George lay where he was and whistled softly to himself. There were sounds of splashings down the river in the direction Lenny had taken. George stopped whistling and listened. Poor bastard, he said softly, and then went on whistling again. In a moment, Lenny came crashing back through the brush. He carried one small willow stick in his hand. George sat up. All right, he said brusquely. Give me that mouse. But Lenny made an elaborate pantomime of innocence. What mouse, George? I ain't got no mouse. George held out his hand. Come on, give it to me. You ain't putting nothing over. Lenny hesitated, backed away, looked wildly at the brush line as though he contemplated running for his freedom. George said coldly, You gonna give me that mouse or do I have to sock you? Give you what, George? You know goddamn well what. I want that mouse. Lenny reluctantly reached into his pocket. His voice broke a little. I don't know why I can't keep it. It ain't nobody's mouse. I didn't steal it. I found it lying right beside the road. George's hand remained outstretched imperiously. Slowly, like a terrier who doesn't want to bring a ball to its master, Lenny approached, drew back, approached again. George snapped his fingers sharply, and at the sound, Lenny laid the mouse in his hand. I wasn't doing nothing bad with it, George. Just stroking it. George stood up and threw the mouse as far as he could into the darkening brush, and then he stepped to the pool and washed his hands. You crazy fool. Don't you think I could see your feet was wet where you went across the river to get it? He heard Lenny's whimpering cry and wheeled about. Blubbering like a baby, 
Jesus Christ. Big guy like you. Lenny's lip quivered and tears started in his eyes. Oh, Lenny. George put his hand on Lenny's shoulder. I ain't taking it away just for meanness. That mouse ain't fresh, Lenny. And besides, you've broke it, petting it. You get another mouse that's fresh, and I'll let you keep it a little while. Lenny sat down on the ground and hung his head dejectedly. I don't know where there is no other mouse. I remember a lady used to give them to me, every one she got. But that lady ain't here. George scoffed. Lady, huh? Don't even remember who that lady was. That was your own Aunt Clara. And she stopped giving them to you. You always killed them. Lenny looked sadly up at him. They was so little, he said apologetically. I'd pet them, and pretty soon they bit my fingers and I pinched their heads a little. And then they was dead, because they was so little. I wish we'd get the rabbits pretty soon, George. They ain't so little. To hell with the rabbits. And you ain't to be trusted with no live mice. Your Aunt Clara give you a rubber mouse and you wouldn't have nothing to do with it. It wasn't no good to pet, said Lenny. The flame of the sunset lifted from the mountaintops, and dusk came into the valley, and a half-darkness came in among the willows and the sycamores. A big carp rose to the surface of the pool, gulped air, and then sank mysteriously into the dark water again, leaving widening rings on the water. Overhead the leaves whisked again, and little puffs of willow cotton blew down and landed on the pool's surface. You gonna get that wood? George demanded. There's plenty right up against the back of that sycamore, floodwater wood. Now you get it. Lenny went behind the tree and brought out a litter of dried leaves and twigs. He threw them in a heap on the old ash pile and went back for more and more. It was almost night now. A dove's wings whistled over the water. George walked to the fire pile and lighted the dry leaves. The flame cracked up among the twigs and fell to work. George undid his bindle and brought out three cans of beans. He stood them about the fire, close in against the blaze, but not quite touching the flame. There's enough beans for four men, George said. Lenny watched him from over the fire. He said patiently, I like them with ketchup. Well, we ain't got any, George exploded. Whatever we ain't got, that's what you want. God Almighty! If I was alone, I could live so easy. I could go get a job and work and no trouble, no mess at all. And when the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go into town and get whatever I want. Well, I could stay in a cat house all night. I could eat any place I want hotel or any place, and order any damn thing I could think of. And I could do all that every damn month. Get a gallon of whiskey or sit in a pool room and play cards or shoot poo. Lenny knelt and looked over the fire at the angry George. And Lenny's face was drawn with terror. And what do I got? George went on furiously. I got you! You can't keep a job and you lose me every job I get. Just keep me shoving all over the country all the time and that ain't the worst. You get in trouble. You do bad things and I gotta get you out. His voice rose nearly to a shout. You crazy son of a bitch. You keep me in hot water all the time. He took on the elaborate manner of little girls when they're mimicking one another. Just wanted to feel that girl's dress. Just wanted to pet it like it was a mouse. Well, how the hell did she know you just wanted to feel her dress? 
She jerks back, and you hold on like it was a mouse. She yells, and we got to hide in an irrigation ditch all day with guys looking for us, and we got to sneak out in the dark and get out of the country. All the time, something like that. All the time. I wished I could put you in a cage with about a million mice and let you have fun. His anger left him suddenly. He looked across the fire at Lenny's anguished face, and then he looked ashamedly at the flames. It was quite dark now, but the fire lighted the trunks of the trees and the curving branches overhead. Lenny crawled slowly and cautiously around the fire until he was close to George. He sat back on his heels. George turned the bean cans so that another side faced the fire. He pretended to be unaware of Lenny so close beside him. George? Very softly. No answer. George? What do you want? I was only fooling, George. I don't want no ketchup. I wouldn't eat no ketchup if it was right here beside me. If it was here, you could have some. But I wouldn't eat none, George. I'd leave it all for you. You could cover your beans with it, and I wouldn't touch none of it. George still stared morosely at the fire. When I think of the swell time I could have without you, I go nuts. I never get no peace. Lenny still knelt. He looked off into the darkness across the river. George, you want I should go away and leave you alone? Where the hell could you go? Well, I could. I could go off in the hills there. Some place I'd find a cave. Yeah? How'd you eat? You ain't got sense enough to find nothing to eat. I'd find things, George. I don't need no nice food with ketchup. I'd lay out in the sun and nobody'd hurt me. And if I found a mouse, I could keep it. Nobody'd take it away from me. George looked quickly and searchingly at him. I've been mean, ain't I? If you don't want me, I can go off in the hills and find a cave. I can go away any time. No. Look, I was just fooling, Lenny. Because I want you to stay with me. Trouble with mice is you always kill them. He paused. Tell you what I'll do, Lenny. First chance I get, I'll give you a pup. Maybe you wouldn't kill it. That'd be better than mice. And you could pet it harder. Lenny avoided the bait. He'd sensed his advantage. If you don't want me, you only just got to say so, and I'll go off in those hills right there, right up in those hills and live by myself. And I won't get no mice stole from me. George said, I want you to stay with me, Lenny. Jesus Christ, somebody'd shoot you for a coyote if you was by yourself. No, you stay with me. Your Aunt Clara wouldn't like you running off by yourself, even if she is dead. Lenny spoke craftily. Tell me, like you done before. Tell you what? About the rabbits. George snapped. You ain't gonna put nothing over on me. Then he pleaded, Come on, George. Tell me. Please, George, like you done before. You get a kick out of that, don't you? All right. I'll tell you, and then we'll eat our supper. 
George's voice became deeper. He repeated his words rhythmically, as though he'd said them many times before. Guys like us that work on ranches are the loneliest guys in the world. They got no family. They don't belong no place. They come to a ranch and work up a stake, and then they go into town and blow their stake, and the first thing you know, they're pounding their tail on some other ranch. They ain't got nothing to look ahead to. Lenny was delighted. That's it. That's it. Now, tell how it is with us. George went on. With us, it ain't like that. We got a future. We got somebody to talk to that gives a damn about us. We don't have to sit in no bar room blowing in our jack just because we got no place else to go. If them other guys gets in jail, they can rot for all anybody gives a damn, but not us. Then he broke in. But not us. And why? Because... Because I got you to look after me, and you got me to look after you, and that's why. He laughed delightedly. Go on now, George. You got it by heart. You can do it yourself. No, you. I forget some of the things. Tell about how it's going to be. Okay. Someday... We're going to get the jack together, and we're going to have a little house and a couple of acres and a cow and some pigs and... And live off the fat of the land, then he shouted, and have rabbits. Go on, George, tell about what we're going to have in the garden and about the rabbits in the cages and about the rain in the winter and the stove and how thick the cream is on the milk like you can hardly cut it. Tell about that, George. Why don't you do it yourself? You know all of it. No, you tell it. It ain't the same if I tell it. Go on, George. How I get to tend the rabbits. Well, said George, we'll have a big vegetable patch and a rabbit hutch and chickens. And when it rains in the winter, we'll just say the hell with going to work and we'll build up a fire in the stove and sit around it and listen to the rain coming down on the roof. Nuts. He took out his pocket knife. I ain't got time for no more. He drove his knife through the top of one of the bean cans, sawed out the top and passed the can to Lenny. Then he opened a second can. From his side pocket he brought out two spoons and passed one of them to Lenny. They sat by the fire and filled their mouths with beans and chewed mightily. A few beans slipped out of the side of Lenny's mouth. George gestured with his spoon. What you gonna say tomorrow when the boss asks you questions? Lenny stopped chewing and swallowed. His face was concentrated. I... I ain't gonna... Say a word. Good boy. That's fine, Lenny. Maybe you're getting better. When we get the couple of acres, I can let you tend the rabbits, all right? Especially if you remember as good as that. Lenny choked with pride. I can remember, he said. George motioned with his spoon again. Look, Lenny, I want you to look around here. You can remember this place, can't you? The ranch is about a quarter mile up that way. Just follow the river? Sure, said Lenny. I can remember this. Didn't I remember about not going to say a word? Of course you did. Well, look, Lenny, if you just happen to get in trouble like you always done before, I want you to come right here and hide in the brush. Hide in the brush, said Lenny slowly. Hide in the brush till I come for you. Can you remember that? Sure I can, George. 
hide in the brush till you come. But you ain't gonna get in no trouble, because if you do, I won't let you tend the rabbits. He threw his empty bean can off into the brush. I won't get in no trouble, George. I ain't gonna say a word. Okay. Bring your bindle over here by the fire. It's gonna be nice sleeping here, looking up in the leaves. Don't build up no more fire. We'll let her die down. They made their beds on the sand, and as the blaze dropped from the fire, the sphere of light grew smaller. The curling branches disappeared, and only a faint glimmer showed where the tree trunks were. From the darkness, Lenny called, George? You asleep? No. What do you want? Let's have different color rabbits, George. Sure we will, George said sleepily. Red and blue and green rabbits, Lenny. Millions of them. Furry ones, George. Like I seen in the fair in Sacramento. Sure. Furry ones. Cause I can just as well go away, George. And live in a cave. You can just as well go to hell, said George. Shut up now. The red light dimmed on the coals. Up the hill from the river, a coyote yammered, and a dog answered from the other side of the stream. The sycamore leaves whispered in a little night breeze. The bunkhouse was a long, rectangular building. Inside, the walls were whitewashed and the floor unpainted. In three walls, there were small square windows, and in the fourth, a solid door with a wooden latch. Against the walls were eight bunks, five of them made up with blankets, and the other three showing their burlap ticking. Over each bunk, there was nailed an apple box with the opening forward, so that it made two shelves for the personal belongings of the occupant of the bunk. And these shelves were loaded with little articles, soap and talcum powder, razors, and those Western magazines ranchmen love to read and scoff at and secretly believe. And there were medicines on the shelves and little vials, combs, and from nails on the box sides a few neckties. Near one wall there was a black cast-iron stove, its stovepipe going straight up through the ceiling. In the middle of the room stood a big square table littered with playing cards, and around it were grouped boxes for the players to sit on. At about ten o'clock in the morning, the sun threw a bright dust-laden bar through one of the side windows, and in and out of the beam flies shot like rushing stars. The wooden latch raised. The door opened, and a tall, stoop-shouldered old man came in. He was dressed in blue jeans, and he carried a big push broom in his left hand. Behind him came George, and behind George, Lenny. The boss was expecting you last night, the old man said. He was sore as hell when you wasn't here to go out this morning. He pointed with his right arm, and out of the sleeve came a round, stick-like wrist, but no hand. You can have them two beds there, he said, indicating two bunks near the stove. George stepped over and threw his blankets down on the burlap sack of straw that was a mattress. He looked into his box shelf and then picked a small yellow can from it. Say, what the hell is this? I don't know said the old man. Says, positively kills lice, roaches, and other scourges. What the hell kind of bed are you giving us anyway? We don't want no pants rabbits. The old swamper lifted his broom and held it between his elbow and his side while he held out his hand for the can. He studied the label carefully. Tell you what, he said finally, Last guy that had this bed was a blacksmith. Hell of a nice fella, and as clean a guy as you'd want to meet. 
He used to wash his hands even after he ate. Then how come he got graybacks? George was working up a slow anger. Lenny put his bindle on the neighboring bunk and sat down. He watched George with open mouth. Tell you what, said the old swamper. This here blacksmith, name of Whitey, was the kind of guy that would put that stuff around even if there wasn't no bugs, just to make sure, see? Tell you what he used to do. At meals, he'd peel his boiled potatoes and he'd take out every little spot, no matter what kind, before he'd eat it. And if there was a red splotch on an egg, he'd scrape it off. Finally quit about the food. That's the kind of guy he was. Clean. He used to dress up Sundays even when he wasn't going no place. Put on a necktie even. And then sit in the bunkhouse. I ain't so sure, said George skeptically. What'd you say he quit for? The old man put the yellow can in his pocket and he rubbed his bristly white whiskers with his knuckles. Why, he just quit the way a guy will. Says it was the food. Just wanted to move. Didn't give no other reason but the food. Just says, give him my time one night the way any guy would. George lifted his tick and looked underneath it. He leaned over and inspected the sacking closely. Immediately, Lenny got up and did the same with his bed. Finally, George seemed satisfied. He unrolled his bindle and put things on the shelf, his razor and bar of soap, his comb and bottle of pills, his liniment and leather wristband. Then he made his bed up neatly with blankets. The old man said, I guess the boss will be out here in a minute. He was sure burned when you wasn't here this morning. Come right in when we was eating breakfast and says, Where the hell's them new men? And he gave the stable buck hell, too. George patted a wrinkle out of his bed and sat down. Give the stable buck hell? he asked. Sure. You see, the stable buck's a nigger. Nigger, huh? Yeah, nice fella, too. Got a crooked back where a horse kicked him. The boss gives him hell when he's mad, but the stable buck don't give a damn about that. He reads a lot. Got books in his room. What kind of guy is the boss? George asked. Well, he's a pretty nice fella. Gets pretty mad sometimes, but he's pretty nice. Tell you what. Know what he done Christmas? Bring a gallon of whiskey right in here and says, Drink hearty, boys. Christmas comes but once a year. The hell he did? Whole gallon? Yes, sir. Jesus, we had fun. They let the nigger come in that night. Little Skinner named Smitty took after the nigger. Done pretty good, too. The guys wouldn't let him use his feet, so the nigger got him. If he could have used his feet, Smitty says he would have killed the nigger. The guy said on account of the nigger's got a crooked back, Smitty can't use his feet. He paused in relish of the memory. After that, the guys went into Soledad and raised hell. I didn't go in there. I ain't got the poop no more. Lenny was just finishing making his bed. The wooden latch raised again, and the door opened. A little stocky man stood in the open doorway. He wore blue jean trousers, a flannel shirt, a black unbuttoned vest, and a black coat. His thumbs were stuck in his belt on each side of a square steel buckle. On his head was a soiled brown Stetson hat, and he wore high-heeled boots and spurs to prove he wasn't a laboring man. The old swamper looked quickly at him, then shuffled to the door, rubbing his whiskers with his knuckles as he went. Them guys just come, he said, and shuffled past the boss and out the door. The boss stepped into the room with the short, quick steps of a fat-legged man. I wrote Murray and Reddy. 
I wanted two men this morning. You got your work slips? George reached into his pocket and produced the slips and handed them to the boss. It wasn't Murray and Reddy's fault. It says right here on the slip that you used to be here for work this morning. George looked down at his feet. Bus driver gave us a bum steer, he said. We had to walk ten miles. Says we was here when we wasn't. We couldn't get no rides in the morning. The boss squinted his eyes. Well, I had to send out the grain team short two buckers. Won't do any good to go out now until after dinner. He pulled his time book out of his pocket and opened it where a pencil was stuck between the leaves. George scowled meaningfully at Lenny, and Lenny nodded to show that he understood. The boss licked his pencil. What's your name? George Milton. And what's yours? George said, his name's Lenny Small. The names were entered in the book. Let's see. This is the 20th. Noon the 20th. He closed the book. Where you boys been working? Up around Weed, said George. You too? To Lenny. Yeah, him too, said George. The boss pointed a playful finger at Lenny. He ain't much of a talker, is he? No, he ain't. But he's sure a hell of a good worker, strong as bull. Then he smiled to himself. Strong as a bull, he repeated. George scowled at him, and Lenny dropped his head in shame at having forgotten. The boss said suddenly, Listen, small. Lenny raised his head. What can you do? In a panic, Lenny looked at George for help. He can do anything you tell him, said George. He's a good skinner. He can wrestle grain bags, drive a cultivator. He can do anything, just give him a try. The boss turned on George. Then why don't you let him answer? What are you trying to put over? George broke in loudly. Oh, I ain't saying he's bright. He ain't. But I say he's a goddamn good worker. He can put up a 400-pound bale. The boss deliberately put the little book in his pocket. He hooked his thumbs in his belt and squinted one eye nearly closed. Say, what you selling? Huh? I said, what stake you got in this guy? You taking his pay away from him? No, of course I ain't. Why you think I'm selling him out? Well, I never seen one guy take so much trouble for another guy. I'd just like to know what your interest is. George said, He's my cousin. I told his old lady I'd take care of him. He got kicked in the head by a horse when he was a kid. He's all right, just ain't bright but he can do anything you tell him. The boss turned half away. Well, God knows he don't need any brains to buck barley bags, but don't you try to put nothing over, Milton. I got my eye on you. Why'd you quit and weed? Job was done, said George promptly. What kind of job? We, uh, we was digging a cesspool. All right, but don't try to put nothing over, cause you can't get away with nothing. I seen wise guys before. Go on out with the grain teams after dinner. They're picking up barley at the threshing machine. Go out with Slim's team. Slim? Yeah, big, tall Skinner. You'll see him at dinner. He turned abruptly and went to the door. But before he went out, he turned and looked for a long moment at the two men. When the sound of his footsteps had died away, George turned on Lenny. So you wasn't going to say a word. You was going to leave your big flapper shut and leave me do the talking. 
damn near lost us the job. Lenny stared hopelessly at his hands. I forgot, George. Yeah, you forgot. You always forget, and I gotta talk you out of it. He sat down heavily on the bunk. Now he's got his eye on us. Now we gotta be careful and not make no slips. You keep your big flapper shut after this. He fell morosely silent. George, what you want now? I wasn't kicked in the head with no horse, was I, George? Be a damn good thing if you was, George said viciously. Save everybody a hell of a lot of trouble. You said I was your cousin, George. Well, that was a lie, and I'm damn glad it was. If I was a relative of yours, I'd shoot myself. He stopped suddenly, stepped to the open front door and peered out. Say, what the hell you doing, listening? The old man came slowly into the room. He had his broom in his hand, and at his heels there walked a drag-footed sheepdog, gray of muzzle and with pale, blind old eyes. The dog struggled lamely to the side of the room and lay down, grunting softly to himself and licking his grizzled, moth-eaten coat. The swamper watched him until he was settled. I wasn't listening. I was just standing in the shade a minute, scratching my dog. I just now finished swamping out the wash house. You was poking your big ears into our business, George said. I don't like nobody to get nosy. The old man looked uneasily from George to Lenny and then back. I'd just come there. He said, I didn't hear nothing you guys was saying. I ain't interested in nothing you was saying. A guy on a ranch don't never listen, nor he don't ask no questions. Damn right he don't, said George, slightly mollified. Not if he wants to stay working long. But he was reassured by the swamper's defense. Come on in and sit down a minute, he said. That's a hell of an old dog. Yeah, I had him ever since he was a pup. God, he was a good sheep dog when he was younger. He stood his broom against the wall, and he rubbed his white bristled cheek with his knuckles. How'd you like the boss? he asked. Pretty good. Seemed all right. He's a nice fella, the swamper agreed. You gotta take him right. At that moment, a young man came into the bunkhouse, a thin young man with a brown face, with brown eyes and a head of tightly curled hair. He wore a work glove on his left hand, and like the boss, he wore high-heeled boots. Seen my old man? he asked. The swamper said, He was here just a minute ago, Curly. Went over to the cookhouse, I think. I'll try to catch him said Curly. His eyes passed over the new man, and he stopped. He glanced coldly at George, and then at Lenny. His arms gradually bent at the elbows, and his hands closed into fists. He stiffened and went into a slight crouch. His glance was at once calculating and pugnacious. Lenny squirmed under the look and shifted his feet nervously. Curly stepped gingerly close to him. You the new guys the old man was waiting for? We just come in, said George. Let the big guy talk. Lenny twisted with embarrassment. George said, Suppose he don't want to talk. Curly lashed his body around. By Christ, he's got to talk when he's spoken to. What the hell are you getting into it for? We traveled together, said George coldly. Oh, so it's that way. George was tense and motionless. Yeah, it's that way. 
Lenny was looking helplessly to George for instruction. And you won't let the big guy talk, is that it? He can talk if he wants to tell you anything. He nodded slightly to Lenny. We've just come in, said Lenny softly. Curly stared levelly at him. Well, next time you answer when you spoke to. He turned toward the door and walked out, and his elbows were still bent out a little. George watched him out, and then he turned back to the swamper. Say, what the hell's he got on his shoulder? Lenny didn't do nothing to him. The old man looked cautiously at the door to make sure no one was listening. That's the boss's son, he said quietly. Curly's pretty handy. He done quite a bit in the ring. He's a lightweight and he's handy. Well, let him be handy, said George. He don't have to take after Lenny. Lenny didn't do nothing to him. What's he got against Lenny? The swamper considered. Well, tell you what. Curly's like a lot of little guys. He hates big guys. He's all the time picking scraps with big guys. Kind of like he's mad at him because he ain't a big guy. You seen little guys like that, ain't you? Always scrappy? Sure, said George. I seen plenty tough little guys. But this Curly better not make no mistakes about Lenny. Lenny ain't handy. But this Curly Punk is going to get hurt if he messes around with Lenny. Well, Curly's pretty handy, the swamper said skeptically. Never did seem right to me. Suppose Curly jumps a big guy and licks him. Everybody says what a game guy Curly is. And suppose he does the same thing and gets licked. Then everybody says the big guy ought to pick somebody his own size and maybe they gang up on the big guy. Never did seem right to me. Seems like Curly ain't giving nobody a chance. George was watching the door. He said ominously, Well, he better watch out for Lenny. Lenny ain't no fighter, but Lenny's strong and quick, and Lenny don't know no rules. He walked to the square table and sat down on one of the boxes. He gathered some of the cards together and shuffled them. The old man sat down on another box. Don't tell Curly I said none of this. He'd slew me. He just don't give a damn. Won't ever get canned because his old man's a boss. George cut the cards and began turning them over, looking at each one and throwing it down on a pile. He said, This guy Curly sounds like a son of a bitch to me. I don't like mean little guys. Seems to me like he's worse lately, said the swamper. He got married a couple of weeks ago. Wife lives over in the boss's house. Seems like Curly is cockier than ever since he got married. George grunted. Maybe he's showing off for his wife. The swamper warmed to his gossip. You seen that glove on his left hand? Yeah, I seen it. Well, that glove's full of Vaseline. Vaseline? What the hell for? Well, I'll tell you what. Curly says he's keeping that hand soft for his wife. George studied the cards absorbedly. That's a dirty thing to tell around, he said. The old man was reassured. He'd drawn a derogatory statement from George. He felt safe now, and he spoke more confidently. Well, you see, Curly's wife. George cut the cards again and put out a solitaire lay, slowly and deliberately. Purdy? he asked casually. Yeah, Purdy. But... George studied his cards. But what? Well, she got the eye. Yeah? Married two weeks and got the eye? 
Maybe that's why Curly's pants is full of ants. I seen her give Slim the eye. Slim's a jerk-lined skinner, hell of a nice feller. Slim don't need to wear no high-heeled boots on a grain team. I seen her give Slim the eye. Curly never seen it, and I seen her give Carlson the eye. George pretended a lack of interest. Looks like we was going to have fun. The swamper stood up from his box. Know what I think? George didn't answer. Well, I think Curly's married a tart. He ain't the first, said George. There's plenty done that. This ends disc one of Mice and Men. Disc two. The old man moved toward the door, and his ancient dog lifted his head and peered about, and then got painfully to his feet to follow. I gotta be setting out the wash basins for the guys. The teams will be in before long. You guys gonna buck barley? Yeah. You won't tell Curly nothing I said. Hell no. Well, you look her over, mister. You see if she ain't a tart. He stepped out the door into the brilliant sunshine. George laid down his cards thoughtfully, turned his piles of three. He built four clubs on his ace pile. The sun square was on the floor now, and the flies whipped through it like sparks. A sound of jingling harness and the croak of heavy-laden axles sounded from outside. From the distance came a clear call. Stable buck. Oh, stable buck. And then, where the hell is that goddamn nigger? George stared at his solitaire lay, and then he flounced the cards together and turned around to Lenny. Lenny was lying down on the bunk watching him. Look, Lenny, this here ain't no setup. I'm scared. You gonna have trouble with that curly guy. I seen that kind before. He was kind of feeling you out. He figures he's got you scared, and he's going to take a sock at you the first chance he gets. Lenny's eyes were frightened. I don't want no trouble, he said plaintively. Don't let him sock me, George. George got up and went over to Lenny's bunk and sat down on it. I hate that kind of bastard, he said. I've seen plenty of them. Like the old guy says, Curly don't take no chances. He always wins. He thought for a moment. If he tangles with you, Lenny, we're going to get the can. Don't make no mistake about that. He's the boss's son. Look, Lenny, you try to keep away from him, will you? Don't never speak to him. If he comes in here, you move clear to the other side of the room. Will you do that, Lenny? I don't want no trouble, Lenny mourned. I never done nothing to him. Well, that won't do you no good if Curly wants to plug himself up for a fighter. Just don't have nothing to do with him. Will you remember? Sure, George. I ain't gonna say a word. The sound of the approaching grain teams was louder, thud of big hooves on hard ground, drag of brakes and the jingle of trace chains. Men were calling back and forth from the teams. George, sitting on the bunk beside Lenny, frowned as he thought. Lenny asked timidly, You ain't mad, George? I ain't mad at you. I'm mad at this here curly bastard. I hoped we was going to get a little steak together, maybe a hundred dollars. His tone grew decisive. You keep away from Curly, Lenny. Sure I will, George. I won't say a word. Don't let him pull you in. But if the son of a bitch socks you, 
Let him have it. Let him have what, George? Never mind. Never mind. I'll tell you when. I hate that kind of a guy. Look, Lenny, if you get in any kind of trouble, you remember what I told you to do. Lenny raised up on his elbow, his face contorted with thought. Then his eyes moved sadly to George's face. If I get in any trouble, you ain't going to let me tend the rabbits. That's not what I meant. You remember where we slept last night, down by the river? Yeah, I remember. Oh, sure, I remember. I go there and hide in the brush. Hide till I come for you. Don't let nobody see you. Hide in the brush by the river. Say that over. Hide in the brush by the river. Down in the brush by the river. If you get in trouble. If I get in trouble. A brake screeched outside. A call came. Stable buck. Oh, stable buck. George said, say it over to yourself, Lenny, so you won't forget it. Both men glanced up for the rectangle of sunshine in the doorway was cut off. A girl was standing there looking in. She had full rouged lips and wide-spaced eyes, heavily made up. Her fingernails were red. Her hair hung in little rolled clusters like sausages. She wore a cotton house dress and red mules, on the insteps of which were little bouquets of red ostrich feathers. I'm looking for Curly, she said. Her voice had a nasal, brittle quality. George looked away from her and then back. He was in here a minute ago, but he went. Oh. She put her hands behind her back and leaned against the doorframe so that her body was thrown forward. You're the new fellas that just come, ain't you? Yeah. Lenny's eyes moved down over her body, and though she didn't seem to be looking at Lenny, she bridled a little. She looked at her fingernails. Sometimes Curly's in here, she explained. George said brusquely, Well, he ain't now. If he ain't, I guess I better look someplace else, she said playfully. Lenny watched her, fascinated, George said, If I see him, I'll pass the word you was looking for him. She smiled archly and twitched her body. Nobody can't blame a person for looking, she said. There were footsteps behind her going by. She turned her head. Hi, Slim, she said. Slim's voice came through the door. Hi, good looking. I'm trying to find Curly, Slim. Well, you ain't trying very hard. I seen him going in your house. She was suddenly apprehensive. Bye, boys. She called into the bunkhouse, and she hurried away. George looked around at Lenny. Jesus, what a tramp, he said. So that's what Curly picks for a wife. She's purdy, said Lenny defensively. Yeah, and she's sure hiding it. Curly got his work ahead of him. Bet she'd clear out for twenty bucks. Lenny still stared at the doorway where she'd been. Gosh, she was purdy. He smiled admiringly. George looked quickly down at him, and then he took him by an ear and shook him. Listen to me, you crazy bastard. He said fiercely, Don't you even take a look at that bitch. I don't care what she says and what she does. I seen em poison before, but I never seen no piece of jail bait worse than her. You leave her be. Lenny tried to disengage his ear. 
Well, I never done nothing, George. No, you never. But when she was standing in the doorway showing her legs, you wasn't looking the other way, neither. Well, I never meant no harm, George. Honest, I never. Well, you keep away from her, cause she's a rat trap if I ever seen one. You let Curly take the rap. He let himself in for it. Glove full of Vaseline, George said disgustedly. And I bet he's eating raw eggs and writing to the patent medicine houses. Lenny cried out suddenly. I don't like this place, George. This ain't no good place. I want to get out of here. We got to keep it till we get a steak. We can't help it, Lenny. We'll get out just as soon as we can. I don't like it no better than you do. He went back to the table and set out a new solitaire hand. No, I don't like it, he said. For two bits, I'd shove out of here. If we can get just a few dollars in the poke, we'll shove off. Go up the American River and pan gold. We can make maybe a couple of dollars a day there, and we might hit a pocket. And then he leaned eagerly toward him. Let's go, George. Let's get out of here. It's mean here. We gotta stay, George said shortly. Shut up now. The guys will be coming in. From the washroom nearby came the sound of running water and rattling basins. George studied the cards. Maybe we ought to wash up, he said. But we ain't done nothing to get dirty. A tall man stood in the doorway. He held a crushed Stetson hat under his arm while he combed his long, black, damp hair straight back. Like the others, he wore blue jeans and a short denim jacket. When he'd finished combing his hair, he moved into the room, and he moved with a majesty only achieved by royalty and master craftsmen. He was a jerkline skinner, the prince of the ranch, capable of driving ten, sixteen, even twenty mules with a single line to the leaders. He was capable of killing a fly on the wheeler's butt with a bullwhip without touching the mule. There was a gravity in his manner and a quiet so profound that all talk stopped when he spoke. His authority was so great that his word was taken on any subject, be it politics or love. This was Slim, the jerkline Skinner. His hatchet face was ageless. He might have been thirty-five or fifty. His ear heard more than was said to him, and his slow speech had overtones not of thought, but of understanding beyond thought. His hands, large and lean, were as delicate in their actions as those of a temple dancer. He smoothed out his crushed hat, creased it in the middle, and put it on. He looked kindly at the two in the bunkhouse. It's brighter than a bitch outside, he said gently. Can't hardly see nothing in here. You the new guy? Just come, said George. Gonna buck barley? That's what the boss says. Slim sat down on a box across the table from George. He studied the solitaire hand that was upside down to him. Hope you get on my team, he said. His voice was very gentle. I got a pair of punks on my team that don't know a barley bag from a blue ball. You guys ever bucked any barley? Hell yes, said George. I ain't nothing to scream about, but that big bastard there can put up more grain alone than most pears can. Lenny, who had been following the conversation back and forth with his eyes, smiled complacently at the compliment. Slim looked approvingly at George for having given the compliment. He leaned over the table and snapped the corner of a loose card. You guys travel around together? His tone was friendly. It invited confidence without demanding it. Sure, said George. We kind of look after each other. He indicated Lenny with his thumb. He ain't bright. Hell of a good worker, though. Hell of a nice fella, but he ain't bright. 
I've knew him for a long time. Slim looked through George and beyond him. Ain't many guys travel around together, he mused. I don't know why. Maybe everybody in the whole damn world is scared of each other. It's a lot nicer to go around with a guy you know, said George. A powerful, big-stomached man came into the bunkhouse. His head still dripped water from the scrubbing and dousing. Hi, Slim he said, then stopped and stared at George and Lenny. These guys just come, said Slim by way of introduction. Glad to meet you, the big man said. My name's Carlson. I'm George Milton. This here's Lenny Small. Glad to meet you, Carlson said again. He ain't very small, he chuckled softly at his joke. Ain't small at all, he repeated. I meant to ask you, Slim, how's your bitch? I seen she wasn't under your wagon this morning. She slang her pups last night, said Slim, nine of them. I drowned four of them right off. She couldn't feed that many. Got five left, huh? Yeah, five. I kept the biggest. What kind of dogs do you think they're going to be? I don't know, said Slim. Some kind of shepherds, I guess. That's the most kind I've seen around here when she was in heat. Carlson went on. Got five pups, huh? Going to keep all of them? I don't know. Have to keep them a while so they can drink Lulu's milk. Carlson said thoughtfully, well, look here, Slim. I've been thinking. That dog of Candy's is so goddamn old he can't hardly walk. Stinks like hell, too. Every time he comes into the bunkhouse, I can smell him for two, three days. Why don't you get Candy to shoot his old dog and give him one of the pups to raise up? I can smell that dog a mile away. Got no teeth, damn near blind, can't eat. Candy feeds him milk. He can't chew nothing else. George had been staring intently at Slim. Suddenly, a triangle began to ring outside, slowly at first, and then faster and faster, until the beat of it disappeared into one ringing sound. It stopped as suddenly as it had started. There she goes said Carlson. Outside, there was a burst of voices as a group of men went by. Slim stood up slowly and with dignity. Hey, you guys better come on while there's still something to eat. Won't be nothing left in a couple of minutes. Carlson stepped back to let Slim precede him, and then the two of them went out the door. Lenny was watching George excitedly, George rumpled his cards into a messy pile. Yeah, George said. I heard him, Lenny. I'll ask you. A brown and white one, Lenny cried excitedly. Come on, let's get dinner. I don't know whether he got a brown and white one. Lenny didn't move from his bunk. You ask him right away, George, so he won't kill no more of them. Sure. Come on now, get up on your feet. Lenny rolled off his bunk and stood up, and the two of them started for the door. Just as they reached it, Curly bounced in. You seen a girl around here? He demanded angrily. George said coldly, About half an hour ago, maybe. Well, what the hell was she doing? George stood still, watching the angry little man. He said insultingly, She said she was looking for you. Curly seemed really to see George for the first time. His eyes flashed over George, took in his height, measured his reach, looked at his trim middle. Well, which way'd she go? He demanded at last. I don't know, said George. I didn't watch her go. 
Curly scowled at him and, turning, hurried out the door. George said, You know, Lenny, I'm scared I'm going to tangle with that bastard myself. I hate his guts. Jesus Christ. Come on, there won't be a damn thing left to eat. They went out the door. The sunshine lay in a thin line under the window. From a distance there could be heard a rattle of dishes. After a moment, the ancient dog walked lamely in through the open door. He gazed about with mild, half-blind eyes. He sniffed and then lay down and put his head between his paws. Curly popped into the doorway again and stood looking into the room. The dog raised his head. But when Curly jerked out, the grizzled head sank to the floor again. Although there was evening brightness showing through the windows of the bunkhouse, inside it was dusk. Through the open door came the thuds and occasional clangs of a horseshoe game, and now and then the sound of voices raised in approval or derision. Slim and George came into the darkening bunkhouse together. Slim reached up over the card table and turned on the tin-shaded electric light. Instantly the table was brilliant with light, and the cone of the shade threw its brightness straight downward, leaving the corners of the bunkhouse still in dusk. Slim sat down on a box, and George took his place opposite. It wasn't nothing, said Slim. I would have had to drown most of them anyways. No need to thank me about that. George said, It wasn't much to you, maybe, but it was a hell of a lot to him. Jesus Christ, I don't know how we're going to get him to sleep in here. He'll want to sleep right out in the barn with him. We'll have trouble keeping him from getting right in a box with them pups. It wasn't nothing, Slim repeated. Say, you sure was right about him. Maybe he ain't bright, but I never seen such a worker. He damn near killed his partner, Buck and Barley. There ain't nobody can keep up with him. God almighty, I never seen such a strong guy. George spoke proudly. Just tell Lenny what to do, and he'll do it if it don't take no figuring. He can't think of nothing to do himself, but he sure can take orders. There was a clang of horseshoe on iron stake outside and a little cheer of voices. Slim moved back slightly so the light wasn't on his face. Funny how you and him string along together. It was Slim's calm invitation to confidence. What's funny about it? George demanded defensively. Oh, I don't know. Hardly none of the guys ever travel together. I hardly never seen two guys travel together. You know how the hands are. They just come in, get their bunk, and work a month, and then they quit and go out alone. Never seem to give a damn about nobody. It just kind of seems funny. A cuckoo like him and a smart little guy like you traveling together. He ain't no cuckoo said George. He's dumb as hell, but he ain't crazy. And I ain't so bright, neither. Or I wouldn't be bucking barley for my fifty and found. If I was bright, if I was even a little bit smart, I'd have my own little place and I'd be bringing in my own crops instead of doing all the work and not getting what comes up out of the ground. George fell silent. He wanted to talk. Slim neither encouraged nor discouraged him. He just sat back, quiet and receptive. It ain't so funny, him and me going round together, George said at last. Him and me was both born in Auburn. I knowed his Aunt Clara. She took him when he was a baby and raised him up. When his Aunt Clara died, then he'd just come along with me out working. Got kind of used to each other after a little while. Hmm, said Slim. George looked over at Slim and saw the calm, godlike eyes fastened on him. 
funny, said George. I used to have a hell of a lot of fun with him. He used to play jokes on him because he was too dumb to take care of himself. But he was too dumb even to know he had a joke played on him. I had fun. Made me seem goddamn smart alongside of him. Why, well, he'd do any damn thing I told him. If I told him to walk over a cliff, over he'd go. That wasn't so damn much fun after a while. He never got mad about it, neither. I've beat the hell out of him, and he could have bust every bone in my body just with his hands, but he never lifted a finger against me. George's voice was taking on the tone of confession. Tell you what made me stop that. One day, a bunch of guys was standing around up on the Sacramento River. I was feeling pretty smart. I turns to Lenny and says, Jump in. And he jumps. Couldn't swim a stroke. He damn near drowned before we could get him. And he was so damn nice to me for pulling him out. Clean forgot I told him to jump in. Well, I ain't done nothing like that no more. He's a nice fellow, said Slim. Guy don't need no sense to be a nice fellow. Seems to me sometimes it just works the other way around. Take a real smart guy and he ain't hardly ever a nice fellow. George stacked the scattered cards and began to lay out his solitaire hand. The shoes thudded on the ground outside. At the windows, the light of the evening still made the window squares bright. I ain't got no people. George said. I seen the guys that go around on the ranches alone. That ain't no good. They don't have no fun. After a long time, they get mean. They get wanting to fight all the time. Yeah, they get mean, Slim agreed. They get so they don't want to talk to nobody. Of course, Lenny's a goddamn nuisance most of the time, said George, but you get used to going around with a guy and you can't get rid of him. He ain't mean, said Slim. I can see Lenny ain't a bit mean. Of course he ain't mean. But he gets in trouble all the time because he's so goddamn dumb. Like what happened in Weed. He stopped. Stopped in the middle of turning over a card. He looked alarmed and peered over at Slim. You wouldn't tell anybody. What'd he do in weed? You wouldn't tell? No, of course you wouldn't. What'd he do in weed? Slim asked again. Well, he seen this girl in a red dress. Dumb bastard like he is, he wants to touch everything he likes, just wants to feel it. So he reaches out to feel this red dress, and the girl lets out a squawk. And that gets Lenny all mixed up, and he holds on, because that's the only thing he can think to do. Well, this girl squawks and squawks. I was just a little bit off, and I heard all the yelling, so I comes running, and by that time, Lenny's so scared, all he can think to do is just hold on. I socked him over the head with a fence picket to make him let go. He was so scared he couldn't let go of that dress, and he's so goddamn strong, you know. Slim's eyes were level and unwinking. He nodded very slowly. So, what happened? George carefully built his line of solitaire cards. Well, that girl rabbits in and tells the law she'd been raped. The guys in weed start a party out to lynch Lenny. So we sit in an irrigation ditch underwater all the rest of that day. Got only our heads sticking out from the side of the ditch. And that night, we scrammed out of there. Slim sat in silence for a moment. Didn't hurt the girl none, huh? He asked finally. 
Hell no. He just scared her. Well, I'd be scared, too, if he grabbed me, but he never hurt her. He just wanted to touch that red dress like he wants to pet them pups all the time. He ain't mean, said Slim. I can tell a mean guy a mile off. Of course he ain't. And he'll do any damn thing. I... Lenny came in through the door. He wore his blue denim coat over his shoulders like a cape, and he walked hunched way over. Hi, Lenny, said George. How do you like the pup now? Lenny said breathlessly, He's brown and white, just like I wanted. He went directly to his bunk and lay down and turned his face to the wall and drew up his knees. George put down his cards very deliberately. Lenny, he said sharply. Then he twisted his neck and looked over his shoulder. Huh? What you want, George? I told you, you couldn't bring that pup in here. What pup, George? I ain't got no pup. George went quickly to him, grabbed him by the shoulder and rolled him over. He reached down and picked the tiny puppy from where Lenny had been concealing it against his stomach. Lenny sat up quickly. Give him to me, George. George said, you get right up and take this pup back to the nest. He's got to sleep with his mother. You want to kill him? Just born last night and you take him out of the nest? You take him back or I'll tell Slim not to let you have him. Lenny held out his hands pleadingly. Give him to me, George. I'll take him back. I didn't mean no harm, George. Honest, I didn't. I just wanted to pet him a little. George handed the pup to him. All right, you get him back there quick, and don't you take him out no more. You'll kill him the first thing you know. Lenny fairly scuttled out of the room. Slim hadn't moved. His calm eyes followed Lenny out the door. Jesus, he said. He's just like a kid, ain't he? Sure, he's just like a kid. There ain't no more harm in him than a kid, neither, except he's so strong. I bet he won't come in here to sleep tonight. He'll sleep right alongside that box in the barn. Well, let him. He ain't doing no harm out there. It was almost dark outside now. Old Candy, the swamper, came in and went to his bunk, and behind him struggled his old dog. Hello, Slim. Hello, George. Didn't neither of you play horseshoes? I don't like to play every night, said Slim. Candy went on. Either you guys got a slug of whiskey. I got a gut ache. I ain't, said Slim. I'd drink it myself if I had, and I ain't got a gut ache neither. Got a bad gut ache, said Candy. Them goddamn turnips give it to me. I knew they was going to before I ever eat them. The thick-bodied Carlson came in out of the darkening yard. He walked to the other end of the bunkhouse and turned on the second shaded light. It's darker than hell in here, he said. Jesus, how that nigger can pitch shoes. He's plenty good, said Slim. Damn right he is, said Carlson. He don't give nobody else a chance to win. He stopped and sniffed the air, and still sniffing, looked down at the old dog. God almighty, that dog stinks. Get him out of here, Candy. I don't know nothing that stinks as bad as an old dog. You got to get him out. Candy rolled to the edge of his bunk. He reached over and patted the ancient dog, and he apologized. Now, I've been around him so much I never notice how he stinks. Well, I can't stand him in here, said Carlson. That stink hangs around even after he's gone. 
He walked over with his heavy-legged stride and looked down at the dog. Got no teeth? He said he's all stiff with rheumatism. He ain't no good to you, Candy, and he ain't no good to himself. Why don't you shoot him, Candy? The old man squirmed uncomfortably. Well, hell, I had him so long. Had him since he's a pup. I herded sheep with him, he said proudly. He wasn't thinking to look at him now, but he is the best damn sheepdog I ever seen. George said, I seen a guy in weed that had an Airedale could herd sheep, learned it from the other dogs. Carlson wasn't to be put off. Look, Candy, this old dog just suffers itself all the time. If you used to take him out and shoot him right in the back of the head, he leaned over and pointed right there, why, he'd never even know what hit him. Candy looked about unhappily. No, he said softly. No, I couldn't do that. I had him too long. He don't have no fun, Carlson insisted. And he stinks to beat hell. Tell you what, I'll shoot him for you. Then it won't be you that does it. Candy threw his legs off his bunk. He scratched the white stubble whiskers on his cheek nervously. I'm so used to him, he said softly. I had him from a pup. Well, you ain't being kind to him, keeping him alive, said Carlson. Look, Slim's bitch got a litter right now. I bet Slim would give you one of them pups to raise up, wouldn't you, Slim? The Skinner had been studying the old dog with his calm eyes. Yeah, he said, you can have a pup if you want to. He seemed to shake himself free for speech. Carl's right, Candy. That dog ain't no good to himself. I wish somebody'd shoot me if I got old and a cripple. Candy looked helplessly at him, for Slim's opinions were law. Maybe it'd hurt him, he suggested. I don't mind taking care of him. Carlson said, the way I'd shoot him, he wouldn't feel nothing. I'd put the gun right there. He pointed with his toe, right back of the head. It wouldn't even quiver. Candy looked for help from face to face. It was quite dark outside by now. A young laboring man came in. His sloping shoulders were bent forward, and he walked heavily on his heels as though he carried the invisible grain bag. He went to his bunk and put his hat on his shelf. Then he picked a pulp magazine from his shelf and brought it to the light over the table. Did I show you this, Slim? He asked. Show me what? The young man turned to the back of the magazine, put it down on the table and pointed with his finger. Right there, read that. Slim bent over it. Go on said the young man, read it out loud. Dear Editor, Slim read slowly, I read your mag for six years, and I think it is the best on the market. I like stories by Peter Rand. I think he is a wingdang. Give us more like the dark writer. I don't write many letters, just thought I would tell you I think your mag is the best dime's worth I ever spent. Slim looked up questioningly. What you want me to read that for? Whit said, Go on. Read the name at the bottom. Slim read, Yours for success, William Tenner. He glanced up at Whit again. What do you want me to read that for? Whit closed the magazine impressively. Don't you remember Bill Tenner? 
Worked here about three months ago? Slim thought. Little guy, he asked. Drove a cultivator. That's him, Quit cried. That's the guy. Well, you think he's the guy who wrote this letter? I know it. Bill and me was in here one day. Bill had one of them books. It just come. He was looking in it, and he says, I wrote a letter. Wonder if they put it in the book. But it wasn't there. Bill says, maybe they're saving it for later, and that's just what they've done. There it is. Guess you're right, said Slim. Got it right in the book. George held out his hand for the magazine. Let's look at it. Whit found the place again, but he didn't surrender his hold on it. He pointed out the letter with his forefinger, and then he went to his box shelf and laid the magazine carefully in. I wonder if Bill's seen it, he said. Bill and me worked in that patch of field peas, run cultivators, both of us. Bill was a hell of a nice fellow. During the conversation, Carlson had refused to be drawn in. He continued to look down at the old dog. Candy watched him uneasily. At last, Carlson said, If you want me to, I'll put the old devil out of his misery right now and get it over with. Ain't nothing left for him. Can't eat, can't see, can't even walk without hurting. Candy said, hopefully, You ain't got no gun. Hell, I ain't. Got a luger. Won't hurt him none at all. Candy said, Maybe tomorrow. Let's wait till tomorrow. I don't see no reason for it, said Carlson. He went to his bunk, pulled his bag from underneath it, and took out a luger pistol. Let's get it over with, he said. We can't sleep with him stinking around in here. He put the pistol in his hip pocket. Candy looked a long time at Slim to try to find some reversal, and Slim gave him none. At last, Candy said softly and hopelessly, All right, take him. He didn't look down at the dog at all. He lay back on his bunk and crossed his arms behind his head and stared at the ceiling. From his pocket, Carlson took a little leather thong. He stooped over and tied it around the old dog's neck. All the men except Candy watched him. Come on, boy. Come on, boy, he said gently. And he said apologetically to Candy, He won't even feel it. Candy didn't move nor answer him. He twitched the thong. Come on, boy. The old dog got slowly and stiffly to his feet and followed the gently pulling leash. Slim said, Carlson? Yeah? You know what to do. What do you mean, Slim? Take a shovel, said Slim shortly. Oh, sure, I get you. He led the dog out into the darkness. George followed to the door and shut the door and set the latch gently in its place. Candy lay rigidly on his bed, staring at the ceiling. Slim said loudly, One of my lead mules got a bad hoof. Got to get some tar on it. His voice trailed off. It was silent outside. Carlson's footsteps died away. The silence came into the room, and the silence lasted. George chuckled. I bet Lenny's right out there in the barn with his pup. He won't want to come in here no more now he's got a pup. Slim said, Candy, you can have any one of them pups you want. Candy didn't answer. The silence fell on the room again. It came out of the night and invaded the room. George said, 
Anybody like to play a little euchre? I'll play out a few with you, said Whit. They took places opposite each other at the table under the light, but George didn't shuffle the cards. He rippled the edge of the deck nervously, and the little snapping noise drew the eyes of all the men in the room so that he stopped doing it. The silence fell on the room again. A minute passed, and another minute. Candy lay still, staring at the ceiling. Slim gazed at him for a moment, then looked down at his hands. He subdued one hand with the other and held it down. There came a little gnawing sound from under the floor, and all the men looked down toward it gratefully. Only Candy continued to stare at the ceiling. Sounds like there was a rat under there, said George. We ought to get a trap down there. Whit broke out. What the hell's taking him so long? Lay out some cards, why don't you? We ain't going to get no euchre played this way. George brought the cards together tightly and studied the backs of them. The silence was in the room again. A shot sounded in the distance. The men looked quickly at the old man. Every head turned toward him. For a moment he continued to stare at the ceiling. Then he rolled slowly over and faced the wall and lay silent. George shuffled the cards noisily and dealt them. Whit drew a scoring board to him and set the pegs to start. Whit said, I guess you guys really come here to work. How do you mean? George asked. Whit laughed. Well, you come on a Friday. You got two days to work till Sunday. I don't see how you figure, said George. Whit laughed again. You do if you've been around these big ranches much. A guy that wants to look over a ranch comes in Saturday afternoon. He gets Saturday night supper and three meals on Sunday, and he can quit Monday morning after breakfast without turning his hand. But you come to work Friday noon. He got to put in a day and a half no matter how you figure. George looked at him levelly. We're going to stick around a while, he said. Me and Lenny's going to roll up a stake. The door opened quietly, and the stable buck put in his head, a lean negro head lined with pain, the eyes patient. Mr. Slim. Slim took his eyes from old Candy. Huh? Oh, hello, Crooks. What's the matter? You told me to warm up tar for that mule's foot. I got it warm. Oh, sure, Crooks. Now I'll come right out and put it on. I can do it if you want, Mr. Slim. No, I'll come do it myself. He stood up. Crooks said, Mr. Slim? Yeah? That big new guy's messing around your pups out in the barn. Well, he ain't doing no harm. I'll give him one of them pups. Just thought I'd tell you, said Crooks. He's taking them out of the nest and handling them. They won't do them no good. He won't hurt them, said Slim. Now I'll come along with you now. George looked up. If that crazy bastard's fooling around too much, just kick him out, Slim. Slim followed the stable buck out of the room. George dealt, and Whit picked up his cards and examined them. Seen the new kid yet? he asked. What kid? George asked. Why, Curly's new wife. Yeah? I seen her. Well, ain't she a Lulu? Well, I ain't seen that much of her, said George. 
Whit laid down his cards impressively. Well, stick around and keep your eyes open. You'll see plenty. She ain't concealing nothing. I never seen nobody like her. She got the eye going all the time on everybody. I bet she even gives the stable buck the eye. I don't know what the hell she wants. George asked casually, Been any trouble since she got here? It was obvious that Whit wasn't interested in his cards. He laid his hand down and George scooped it in. George laid out his deliberate, solitaire hand, seven cards and six on top and five on top of those. Whit said, oh, I see what you mean. No, there ain't been nothing yet. Curly's got yellow jackets in his drawers, but that's all so far. Every time the guys is around, she shows up. She's looking for Curly, or she thought she left something laying around, and she's looking for it. Seems like she can't keep away from guys. And Curly's pants are just crawling with ants, but there ain't nothing come of it yet. George said, She's going to make a mess. There's going to be a bad mess about her. She's a jailbait all set on the trigger. That Curly got his work cut out for him. Ranch with a bunch of guys on it ain't no place for a girl, especially like her. Whit said, If you got ideas, you ought to come in town with us guys tomorrow night. Why, what's doing? Just the usual thing. We go into old Susie's place. Hell of a nice place. Old Susie's a laugh. All those cracking jokes. Like she says when we come up on the front porch last Saturday night, Susie opens the door, and then she yells over her shoulder, Get your coats on, girls. Here comes the sheriff. But she never talks dirty, neither. Got five girls there. What's it set you back? George asked. Two and a half. You can get a shot for two bits. Susie got nice chairs to sit in, too. If a guy don't want to flop, well, he can just sit in the chairs and have a couple of three shots and pass the time of day. And Susie don't give a damn. She ain't rushing guys through and kicking them out if they don't want to flop. Might go in and look the joint over, said George. Sure, come along. It's a hell of a lot of fun. Her cracking jokes all the time. Like she says one time, she says, I've knew people that if they got a rag rug on the floor and a Cupid doll lamp on the phonograph, they think they're running a parlor house. That's Clara's house she's talking about. And Susie says, I know what you boys want, she says. My girls is clean she says, and there ain't no water in my whiskey. She says, if any of you guys want to look at a Cupid doll lamp and take your own chance getting burned, why, well, you know where to go. And she says, there's guys around here walking bow because they like to look at a Cupid doll lamp. George asked, Clara runs the other house, huh? Yeah, said Whit. Well, we don't never go there. Clara gets three bucks a crack and 35 cents a shot, and she don't crack no jokes. But Susie's place is clean, and she got nice chairs. And don't let no goo-goos in, neither. Me and Lenny's rolling up a steak, said George. I might go in and set and have a shot, but I ain't putting out no two and a half. Well, I gotta have some fun sometime said Whit. The door opened and Lenny and Carlson came in together. Lenny crept to his bunk and sat down, trying not to attract attention. Carlson reached under his bunk and brought out his bag. He didn't look at old Candy, who still faced the wall. Carlson found a little cleaning rod in the bag and a can of oil. He laid them on his bed and then brought out the pistol took out the magazine and snapped the loaded shell from the chamber. Then he fell to cleaning the barrel with a little rod. When the ejector snapped, Candy turned over and looked for a moment at the gun before he turned back to the wall again. 
Carlson said casually. Curly been in yet? No, said Whit. What's eating on Curly? Carlson squinted down the barrel of his gun. Looking for his old lady. I seen him going round and round outside. Whit said sarcastically. He spends half his time looking for her, and the rest of the time she's looking for him. Curly burst into the room excitedly. Any of you guys seen my wife? Carlson finished the cleaning of the gun and put it in the bag and pushed the bag under his bunk. I guess I'll go out and look her over, he said. Old Candy lay still, and Lenny, from his bunk, watched George cautiously. When Whit and Carlson were gone and the door closed after them, George turned to Lenny. What you got on your mind? Well, I ain't done nothing, George. Slim says I better not pet them pups so much for a while. Slim says it ain't good for them, so I come right in. I've been good, George. Well, I could have told you that, said George. Well, I wasn't hurting them none. I just had mine in my lap, petting it. George asked, Did you see Slim out in the barn? Sure I did. He told me I better not pet that pup no more. Did you see that girl? You mean Curly's girl? Yeah. Did she come in the barn? No. Anyways, I never seen her. You never seen Slim talking to her? Uh-uh. She ain't been in the barn. Okay, said George. I guess them guys ain't going to see no fight. If there is any fighting, Lenny, you keep out of it. Well, I don't want no fights, said Lenny. He got up from his bunk and sat down at the table across from George. Are you sure that girl didn't come in like she come in here today? No, nope, she never come. George sighed. You give me a good whorehouse every time, he said. A guy can go in and get drunk and get everything out of his system all at once and no messes. And he knows how much it's going to set him back. These here jail baits is just set on the trigger of the hoose cow. Lenny followed his words admiringly and moved his lips a little to keep up. George continued. You remember Andy Cushman, Lenny? Went to grammar school? Uh, the one that his old lady used to make hot cakes for the kids? Then he asked. Yeah, that's the one. You can remember anything if there's anything to eat in it. George looked carefully at the solitary hand. He put an ace up on his scoring rack and piled a two, three, and four of diamonds on it. Andy's in San Quentin right now on account of a tart, said George. Lenny drummed on the table with his fingers. George? Huh? George? How long is it going to be till we get that little place and live on the fat of the land and rabbits? I don't know, said George. We got to get a big stake together. I know a little place we can get cheap, but they ain't giving it away. Old Candy turned slowly over. His eyes were wide open. He watched George carefully. Then he said, Tell about that place, George. I just told you just last night. Go on. Tell again, George. Well, it's ten acres, said George. Got a little windmill, got a little shack on it, and a chicken run. Got a kitchen, 
Orchard, cherries, apples, peaches, cots, nuts. Got a few berries. And there's a place for alfalfa and plenty of water to flood it. And there's a pig pen. And rabbits, George. No place for rabbits now, but I could easily build a few hutches and you could feed alfalfa to the rabbits. Damn right I could, said Lenny. You goddamn right I could. Of Mice and Men, Disc 2. Of Mice and Men, Disc 3. George's hands stopped working with the cards. His voice was growing warmer. And we could have a few pigs. I could build a smokehouse like the one Grandpa had. And when we kill a pig, we can smoke the bacon and the hams and make sausage and all like that. And when the salmon run up river, we could catch a hundred of them and salt them down or smoke them. We could have them for breakfast. Ain't nothing so nice as smoked salmon. When the fruit come in, we could can it. And tomatoes, they're easy to can. Every Sunday, we'd kill a chicken or a rabbit. Maybe we'd have a cow or a goat. And the cream is so goddamn thick, you gotta cut it with a knife and take it out with a spoon. Lenny watched him with wide eyes, and old Candy watched him, too. Lenny said softly, We could live off the fat of the land. Sure, said George. All kinds of vegetables in the garden. And if we want a little whiskey, we can sell a few eggs or something or some milk. We'd just live there. We'd belong there. There wouldn't be no more running around the country and getting fed by a Jap cook. No, sir. We'd have our own place where we belonged and not sleep in no bunkhouse. Tell about the house, George, Lenny begged. Sure. We'd have a little house and a room to ourselves little fat iron stove, and in the winter we'd keep a fire going in it. It ain't enough land, so we'd have to work too hard, maybe six, seven hours a day. We wouldn't have to buck no barley eleven hours a day, and when we put in a crop, why, we'd be there to take the crop up. We'd know what come of our planting. And rabbits, Lenny said eagerly, and I'd take care of them. Tell how I'd do that, George. Sure. You'd go out in the alfalfa patch, and you'd have a sack. You'd fill up the sack and bring it in and put it in the rabbit cages. And they'd nibble and they'd nibble, said Lenny. In the way they do, I seen them. Every six weeks or so, George continued, them does would throw a litter so we'd have plenty of rabbits to eat and to sell. And we'd keep a few pigeons to go flying around the windmill like they'd done when I was a kid. He looked raptly at the wall over Lenny's head. And it'd be our own. And nobody could can us. If we don't like a guy, we can say, get the hell out. And by God, he's got to do it. And if a friend come along... Why, well, we'd have an extra bunk, and we'd say, Why don't you spend the night? And by God, he would. We'd have a setter dog and a couple striped cats, but you gotta watch out, them cats don't get the little rabbits. Then he breathed hard. You just let them try to get the rabbits. I'll break their goddamn necks. I'll, I'll smash them with a stick. He subsided grumbling to himself, threatening the future cats which might dare to disturb the future rabbits. George sat entranced with his own picture. When Candy spoke, they both jumped as though they'd been caught doing something reprehensible. Candy said, You know where's a place like that? George was on guard immediately. Suppose I do. 
And he said, what's that to you? Well, you don't need to tell me where it's at. Might be any place. Sure, said George, that's right. You couldn't find it in a hundred years. Candy went on excitedly. How much they want for a place like that? George watched him suspiciously. Well, I could get it for 600 bucks. The old people that owns it is flat bust, and the old lady needs an operation. Say, what's it to you? You got nothing to do with us. Candy said, Well, I ain't much good with only one hand. I lost my hand right here on this ranch. That's why they give me a job swamping. And they give me $250 because I lost my hand. And I got 50 more saved up right in the bank right now. There's 300. And I got 50 more coming the end of the month. Tell you what, he leaned forward eagerly. Suppose I went in with you guys. That's 350 bucks I'd put in. I ain't much good, but I could cook and tend the chickens and hoe the garden some. How'd that be? George half closed his eyes. I got to think about that. We was always going to do it by ourselves. Candy interrupted him. I'd make a will and leave my share to you guys in case I kick off because I ain't got no relatives nor nothing. You guys got any money? Maybe we could do it right now. George spat on the floor disgustedly. We got ten bucks between us. Then he said thoughtfully, Look, if me and Lenny work a month and don't spend nothing, we'll have a hundred bucks. That'd be four fifty. I bet we could swing her for that. Then you and Lenny could go get her started, and I'd get a job and make up the rest, and you could sell eggs and stuff like that. They fell into a silence. They looked at one another, amazed. This thing they'd never really believed in was coming true. George said reverently, Jesus Christ, I bet we could swing her. His eyes were full of wonder. I bet we could swing her, he repeated softly. Candy sat on the edge of his bunk. He scratched the stump of his wrist nervously. I got hurt four years ago, he said. They'll can me pretty soon. Just as soon as I can't swamp out no bunkhouses, they'll put me on the county. Maybe if I give you guys my money, you let me hoe in the garden even after I ain't no good at it. And I'll wash dishes and little chicken stuff like that. But I'll be on our own place. And I'll be let to work on our own place. He said miserably, You seen what they done to my dog tonight? They says he wasn't no good to himself nor nobody else. When they can me here, I wish somebody'd shoot me. But they won't do nothing like that. I won't have no place to go, and I can't get no more jobs. I'll have thirty dollars more coming, time you guys is ready to quit. George stood up. We'll do her, he said. We'll fix up that little old place, and we'll go live there. He sat down again. They all sat still, all bemused by the beauty of the thing. Each mind was popped into the future when this lovely thing should come about. George said wonderingly, Suppose there was a carnival or a circus come to town or a ball game or any damn thing. Old Candy nodded in appreciation of the idea. 
We just go to her, George said. We wouldn't ask nobody if we could. Just say we'll go to her, and we would. Just milk the cow and sling some grain to the chickens and go to her. And put some grass to the rabbits. Then he broke in. I wouldn't never forget to feed them. When we going to do it, George? In one month. Right squack in one month. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write to them old people that owns the place that will take it. And Candy will send a hundred dollars to bind her. Sure will, said Candy. They got a good stove there? Sure. Got a nice stove. Burns coal or wood. I'm going to take my pup, said Lenny. I bet by Christ he likes it there by Jesus. Voices were approaching from outside. George said quickly, don't tell nobody about it, just the three of us and nobody else. They liable to can us so we can't make no stake. Just go on like we was going to buck barley the rest of our lives. Then all of a sudden, some day, we'll go get our pay and scram out of here. Lenny and Candy nodded, and they were grinning with delight. Don't tell nobody, Lenny said to himself. Candy said, George, huh? I ought to have shot that dog myself, George. I shouldn't ought to have let no stranger shoot my dog. The door opened. Slim came in, followed by Curly and Carlson and Whit. Slim's hands were black with tar, and he was scowling. Curly hung close to his elbow. Curly said, Well, I didn't mean nothing, Slim. I just asked you. Slim said, well, you've been asking me too often. I'm getting goddamn sick of it. If you can't look after your own goddamn wife, what do you expect me to do about it? You lay off of me. I'm just trying to tell you I didn't mean nothing, said Curly. I just thought you might have saw her. Why don't you tell her to stay the hell home where she belongs, said Carlson. You let her hang around bunkhouses, and pretty soon you're going to have something on your hands. You won't be able to do nothing about it. Curly whirled on Carlson. You keep out of this, unless you want to step outside. Carlson laughed. You goddamn punk, he said. You tried to throw a scare into Slim, and you couldn't make it stick. Slim throwed a scare into you. You're yellow as a frog belly. I don't care if you're the best welter in the country. You come for me, and I'll kick your goddamn head off. Candy joined the attack with joy. Glove full of Vaseline, he said disgustedly. Curly glared at him. His eyes slipped on past and lighted on Lenny. And Lenny was still smiling with the delight at the memory of the ranch. Curly stepped over to Lenny like a terrier. What the hell you laughing at? Lenny looked blankly at him. Huh? Then Curly's rage exploded. Come on, you big bastard. Get up on your feet. No big son of a bitch gonna laugh at me. I'll show you who's yellow. Lenny looked helplessly at George, and then he got up and tried to retreat. Curly was balanced and poised. He slashed at Lenny with his left, then smashed down his nose with a right. Lenny gave a cry of terror. Blood welled from his nose. George, he cried. Make him let me alone, George. He backed until he was against the wall, and Curly followed, slugging him in the face. Lenny's hands remained at his sides. He was too frightened to defend himself. George was on his feet, yelling, Get him, Lenny! Don't let him do it. Lenny covered his face with his huge paws and bleated with terror. He cried, Make him stop, George. Then Curly attacked his stomach and cut off his wind. 
Slim jumped up. The dirty little rat, he cried. I'll get him myself. George put out his hand and grabbed Slim. Wait a minute, he shouted. He cupped his hands around his mouth and yelled, Get him, Lenny! Lenny took his hands away from his face and looked about for George, and Curly slashed at his eyes. The big face was covered with blood. George yelled again, I said get him! Curly's fist was swinging when Lenny reached for it. The next minute, Curly was flopping like a fish on a line, and his closed fist was lost in Lenny's big hand. George ran down the room. Let go of him, Lenny. Let go! But Lenny watched in terror the flopping little man whom he held. Blood ran down Lenny's face. One of his eyes was cut and closed. George slapped him in the face again and again, and still Lenny held on to the closed fist. Curly was white and shrunken by now, and his struggling had become weak. He stood crying, his fist lost in Lenny's paw. George shouted over and over, Let go his hand, Lenny! Let go! Slim, come help me while the guy got any hand left. Suddenly Lenny let go his hold. He crouched, cowering against the wall. You told me to, George, he said miserably. Curly sat down on the floor, looking in wonder at his crushed hand. Slim and Carlson bent over him. Then Slim straightened up and regarded Lenny with horror. We got to get him to a doctor, he said. It looked to me like every bone in his hand is bust. I didn't want to, Lenny cried. I didn't want to hurt him. Slim said, Carlson, you get the candy wagon hitched up. We'll take him into Soledad and get him fixed up. Carlson hurried out. Slim turned to the whimpering Lenny. It ain't your fault, he said. This punk sure had it coming to him, but Jesus, he ain't hardly got no hand left. Slim hurried out, and in a moment returned with a tin cup of water. He held it to Curly's lips. George said, Slim, will we get canned now? We need the steak. Will Curly's old man can us now? Slim smiled wryly. He knelt down beside Curly. You got your senses in hand enough to listen? He asked. Curly nodded. Well, then listen, Slim went on. I think you got your hand caught in a machine. If you don't tell nobody what happened, we ain't gonna. But you just tell and try to get this guy canned, and we'll tell everybody, and then will you get the laugh. I won't tell, said Curly. He avoided looking at Lenny. Buggy wheels sounded outside. Slim helped Curly up. Come on now. Do. I told you nobody ought never to fight him. No, I guess it was Candy, I told. Candy nodded solemnly. That's just what you done, he said. Right this morning... When Curly first lit unto your friend, you says, he better not fool with Lenny. He knows what's good for him. That's just what you says to me. George turned to Lenny. It ain't your fault, he said. You don't need to be scared no more. You done just what I told you to do. Maybe you better go in the washroom and clean up your face. You look like hell. Lenny smiled with his bruised mouth. I didn't want no trouble, he said. He walked toward the door, but just before he came to it, he turned back. George? What you want? I can still tend the rabbits, George. Sure. You ain't done nothing wrong. I didn't mean no harm, George. Well, get the hell out and wash your face. Crooks, the Negro stable buck, had his bunk in the harness room. 
a little shed that leaned off the wall of the barn. On one side of the little room there was a square four-paned window, and on the other a narrow plank door leading into the barn. Crook's bunk was a long box filled with straw on which his blankets were flung. On the wall by the window there were pegs on which hung broken harness in process of being mended, strips of new leather, and under the window itself a little bench for leather-working tools, curved knives and needles, and balls of linen thread, and a small hand riveter. On pegs were also pieces of harness, a split collar with the horsehair stuffing sticking out, a broken hame, and a trace chain with its leather covering split. Crooks had his apple box over his bunk, and in it a range of medicine bottles, both for himself and for the horses. There were cans of saddle soap and a drippy can of tar with its paintbrush sticking over the edge. And scattered about the floor were a number of personal possessions. For being alone, Crooks could leave his things about, and being a stable buck and a cripple, he was more permanent than the other men, and he'd accumulated more possessions than he could carry on his back. Crooks possessed several pairs of shoes, a pair of rubber boots, a big alarm clock, and a single-barreled shotgun. And he had books, too, a tattered dictionary and a mauled copy of the California Civil Code for 1905. There were battered magazines and a few dirty books on a special shelf over his bunk. A pair of large gold-rimmed spectacles hung from a nail on the wall above his bed. This room was swept and fairly neat, for Crooks was a proud, aloof man. He kept his distance and demanded that other people keep theirs. His body was bent over to the left by his crooked spine, and his eyes lay deep in his head, and because of their depth seemed to glitter with intensity. His lean face was lined with deep black wrinkles, and he had thin, pain-tightened lips which were lighter than his face. It was Saturday night. Through the open door that led into the barn came the sound of moving horses, of feet stirring, of teeth champing on hay, of the rattle of halter chains. In the stable buck's room, a small electric globe threw a meager yellow light. Crooks sat on his bunk. His shirt was out of his jeans in back. In one hand he held a bottle of liniment, and with the other he rubbed his spine. Now and then he poured a few drops of the liniment into his pink-palmed hand and reached up under his shirt to rub again. He flexed his muscles against his back and shivered. Noiselessly, Lenny appeared in the open doorway and stood there looking in, his big shoulders nearly filling the opening. For a moment Crooks didn't see him, but on raising his eyes he stiffened and a scowl came on his face. His hand came out from under his shirt. Lenny smiled helplessly in an attempt to make friends. Crook said sharply, You got no right to come in my room. This here's my room. Nobody got any right in here but me. Lenny gulped and his smile grew more fawning. Why, well, I ain't doing nothing, he said. Just come to look at my puppy, and I seen your light, he explained. Well, I got a right to have a light. You go on, get out of my room. I ain't wanted in the bunkhouse, and you ain't wanted in my room. Why ain't you wanted, Lenny asked. Cause I'm black. They play cards in there, but I can't play, cause I'm black. They say I stink. Well, I tell you, you all of you stink to me. Lenny flapped his big hands helplessly. Everybody went into town, he said. Slim and George and everybody. George says I got to stay here and not get in no trouble. I seen your light. Well, what do you want? Nothing. I seen your light. 
I thought I could just come in and sit. Crook stared at Lenny, and he reached behind him and took down the spectacles and adjusted them over his pink ears and stared again. I don't know what you're doing in the barn anyway, he complained. You ain't no skinner. There's no call for a bucker to come into the barn at all. You ain't no skinner. You ain't got nothing to do with the horses. The pup, Lenny repeated. I come to see my pup. Well, go see your pup then. Don't come in a place where you're not wanted. Lenny lost his smile. He advanced to step into the room, then remembered and back to the door again. I looked at him a little. Slim says I ain't to pet him very much. Crook said, Well, you've been taking him out of the nest all the time. I wonder the old lady don't move him someplace else. Oh, she don't care. She lets me. Lenny had moved into the room again. Crook scowled, but Lenny's disarming smile defeated him. Come on in and sit a while, Crook said. As long as you won't get out and leave me alone, you might as well sit down. His tone was a little more friendly. All the boys gone into town, huh? All but old Candy. He just sits in the bunkhouse sharpening his pencil and sharpening and figuring. Crooks adjusted his glasses. Figuring? What's Candy figuring about? Lenny almost shouted, "'About the rabbits!' "'You're nuts,' said Crooks. "'You're crazy as a wedge. "'What rabbits you talking about?' "'The rabbits we're going to get, "'and I get to tend them, "'cut grass and give them water and like that.' "'Just nuts,' said Crooks. "'I don't blame the guy you travel with "'for keeping you out of sight.' Lenny said quietly, It ain't no lie. We're going to do it. Going to get a little place and live on the fat of the land. Crook settled himself more comfortably on his bunk. Sit down, he invited. Sit down on the nail keg. Lenny hunched down on the little barrel. You think it's a lie, Lenny said, but it ain't no lie. Every word's the truth, and you can just ask George. Crooks put his dark chin into his pink palm. You travel around with George, don't you? Sure. Me and him goes every place together. Crooks continued. Sometimes he talks, and you don't know what the hell he's talking about. Ain't that so? He leaned forward, boring Lenny with his deep eyes. Ain't that so? Yeah, sometimes. Just talks on and on, and you don't know what the hell it's all about. Yeah, sometimes, but not always. Crooks leaned forward over the edge of the bunk. I ain't a southern negro, he said. I was born right here in California. My old man had a chicken ranch, about ten acres. The white kids come to play at our place, and sometimes I went to play with them, and some of them was pretty nice. My old man didn't like that. I never knew till long later why he didn't like that. But I know now. He hesitated, and when he spoke again, his voice was softer. There wasn't another colored family for miles around. Now there ain't a colored man on this ranch, and there's just one family in Soledad. He laughed. If I say something... Why, it's just a nigger saying it. Lenny asked, 
How long you think it'll be before them pups will be old enough to pet? Crooks laughed again. A guy can talk to you and be sure you won't go blabbing. A couple weeks and them pups will be all right. George knows what he's about. Just talks and you don't understand nothing. He leaned forward excitedly. This is just a nigger talking and a busted back nigger, so it don't mean nothing, see? You couldn't remember it anyways. I seen it over and over. A guy talking to another guy and it don't make no difference if he don't hear or understand. The thing is, they talking. Oh, they're sitting still, not talking. It don't make no difference. No difference. His excitement had increased until he pounded his knee with his hand. George can tell you screwy things and it don't matter. It's just a talking. It's just being with another guy. That's all. He paused. His voice grew soft and persuasive. Suppose George don't come back no more. Suppose he took a powder and just ain't coming back. What'll you do then? Lenny's attention came gradually to what had been said. What? he demanded. I said, Suppose George went into town tonight and you never heard of him no more. Crooks pressed forward some kind of private victory. Just suppose that, he repeated. He won't do it, Lenny cried. George wouldn't do nothing like that. I've been with George a long time. He'll come back tonight. But the doubt was too much for him. Don't you think he will? Crook's face lighted with pleasure in his torture. Nobody can't tell what a guy'll do, he observed calmly. Let's say he wants to come back and can't. Suppose he gets killed or hurt, so he can't come back. Lenny struggled to understand. George won't do nothing like that. He repeated, George is careful. He won't get hurt. He ain't never been hurt cause he's careful. Well, suppose, Jess, suppose he don't come back. What'll you do then? Lenny's face wrinkled with apprehension. I don't know. Say, what are you doing anyways? He cried. This ain't true. George ain't got hurt. Crooks bored in on him. Want me to tell you what'll happen? They'll take you to the booby hatch. They'll tie you up with a collar like a dog. Suddenly Lenny's eyes centered and grew quiet and mad. He stood up and walked dangerously toward Crooks. Who hurt George? He demanded. Crook saw the danger as it approached him. He edged back on his bunk to get out of the way. I was just supposing, he said. George ain't hurt. He's all right. He'll be back all right. Then he stood over him. What you supposing for? Ain't nobody gonna suppose no hurt to George. Crooks removed his glasses and wiped his eyes with his fingers. Just sit down. He said, George ain't hurt. Lenny growled back to his seat on the nail keg. Ain't nobody gonna talk no hurt to George, he grumbled. Crooks said gently, Maybe you can see now. You got George. You know he's gonna come back. Suppose you didn't have nobody. Suppose you couldn't go into the bunkhouse and play rummy cause you was black. How'd you like that? Suppose you had to sit out here and read books. Sure, you could play horseshoes till it got dark. But then you gotta read books. Books ain't no good. A guy needs somebody 
to be near him. He whined, A guy goes nuts if he ain't got nobody. Don't make no difference who the guy is, as long as he's with you. I tell you, he cried, I tell you, a guy gets too lonely and he gets sick. George gonna come back. Then he reassured himself in a frightened voice. Maybe George come back already. Maybe I better go see. Crook said, I didn't mean to scare you. He'll come back. I was talking about myself. Guy sits alone out here at night, maybe reading books or thinking or stuff like that. Sometimes he gets thinking, and he got nothing to tell him what's so and what ain't so. Maybe if he sees something, he don't know whether it's right or not. He can't turn to some other guy and ask him if he sees it too. He can't tell. He got nothing to measure by. I seen things out here. I wasn't drunk. I don't know if I was asleep. If some guy was with me, he could tell me I was asleep, and then it would be all right. But I just don't know. Crooks was looking across the room now, looking toward the window. Lenny said miserably, George wouldn't go away and leave me. I know George wouldn't do that. The stable buck went on dreamily. I remember when I was a little kid on my old man's chicken ranch. Had two brothers. They was always near me, always there. Used to sleep right in the same room, right in the same bed, all three. Had a strawberry patch. Had an alfalfa patch. Used to turn the chickens out in the alfalfa on a sunny morning. My brothers had sit on a fence rail and watch them. White chickens, they was. Gradually, Lenny's interest came around to what was being said. George says we're going to have alfalfa for the rabbits. What rabbits? We're going to have rabbits and a berry patch. You nuts. We are, too. You ask George. You're nuts. Crooks was scornful. I seen hundreds of men come by on the road and on the ranches with their bindles on their back and that same damn thing in their heads. Hundreds of them. They come and they quit and go on and every damn one of them's got a little piece of land in his head. And never a goddamn one of them ever gets it. Just like heaven. Everybody wants a little piece of land. I read plenty of books out here. Nobody never gets to heaven, and nobody gets no land. It's just in their head. They all the time talking about it, but it's just in their head. He paused and looked toward the open door, for the horses were moving restlessly and the halter chains clinked. A horse whinnied. I guess somebody's out there, Crook said. Maybe Slim. Slim comes in sometimes two, three times a night. Slim's a real skinner. He looks out for his team. He pulled himself painfully upright and moved toward the door. That you, Slim? He called. Candy's voice answered. Slim went in town. Say, you seen Lenny? You mean the big guy? Yeah. Seen him around any place? He's in here, Crook said shortly. He went back to his bunk and lay down. Candy stood in the doorway, scratching his bald wrist and looking blindly into the lighted room. He made no attempt to enter. Tell you what, Lenny, I've been figuring out about them rabbits, Crook said irritably. You can come in if you want. Candy seemed embarrassed. 
I don't know. Cause if you want me to, come on in. If everybody's coming in, you might just as well. It was difficult for Crooks to conceal his pleasure with anger. Candy came in, but he was still embarrassed. He got a nice, cozy little place in here, he said to Crooks. Must be nice to have a room all to yourself this way. Sure, said Crooks. And the manure pile under the window. Sure, it's well. Lenny broke in. You said about them rabbits? Candy leaned against the wall beside the broken collar while he scratched the wrist stump. I've been here a long time, he said, and Crook's been here a long time. This is the first time I ever been in his room, Crook said darkly. Guys don't come into a colored man's room very much. Nobody been here but Slim, Slim and the boss. Candy quickly changed the subject. Slim's as good a skinner as I ever seen. Lenny leaned toward the old swamper. About them rabbits, he insisted. Candy smiled. I got it figured out. We can make some money on them rabbits if we go about it right. But I get to tend them, Lenny broke in. George says I get to tend them. He promised. Crooks interrupted brutally. You guys are just kidding yourself. You'll talk about it a hell of a lot, but you won't get no land. You'll be a swamper here till they take you out in a box. Hell, I seen too many guys. Lenny here will quit and be on the road in two, three weeks. Seems like every guy got land in his head. Candy rubbed his cheek angrily. You goddamn right we're gonna do it. George says we are. We got the money right now. Yeah, said Crooks. And where's George now? In town in a whorehouse. That's where your money's going, Jesus. I've seen it happen too many times. I've seen too many guys with land in the head. They never get none under their hand. Candy cried. Sure, they all want it. Everybody wants a little bit of land. Not much. Something he could live on and there couldn't nobody throw him off of it. I never had none. I planted crops for damn near everybody in this state, but they wasn't my crops, and when I harvested them, it wasn't none of my harvest. But we're going to do it now. And don't make no mistake about that. George ain't got the money in town. That money's in the bank. Me and Lenny and George, we're going to have a room to ourselves. We're going to have a dog and rabbits and chickens. We're going to have green corn and maybe a cow or a goat. He stopped, overwhelmed with his picture. Crooks asked, You say you got the money? Damn right. We got most of it. Just a little bit more to get. Have it all in one month. George got the land all picked out, too. Crooks reached around and explored his spine with his hand. I never seen a guy really do it, he said. I seen guys nearly crazy with loneliness for land, but every time a whorehouse or a blackjack game took what it takes. He hesitated. If you guys would want a hand to work for nothing, just his keep, well, I'd come and lend a hand. I ain't so crippled, I can't work like a sumbitch if I want to. Any of you boys seen Curly? They swung their heads toward the door. Looking in was Curly's wife. Her face was heavily made up. Her lips were slightly parted. She breathed strongly as though she'd been running. 
Curly ain't been here, Candy said sourly. She stood still in the doorway, smiling a little at them, rubbing the nails of one hand with the thumb and forefinger of the other, and her eyes traveled from one face to another. They left all the weak ones here, she said finally. Think I don't know where they all went? Even Curly? I know where they all went. Lenny watched her, fascinated. But Candy and Crooks were scowling down away from her eyes. Candy said, Then if you know, why you won't ask us where Curly's at? She regarded them amusedly. Funny thing, she said. If I catch any one man and he's alone, I get along fine with him. But just let two of the guys get together and you won't talk. Just nothing but mad. She dropped her fingers and put her hands on her hips. You're all scared of each other, that's what. Every one of you is scared the rest is going to get something on you. After a pause, Crook said, Maybe you better go along to your own house now. We don't want no trouble. Well, I ain't giving you no trouble. Think I don't like to talk to somebody every once in a while? Think I like to stick in that house all the time? Candy laid the stump of his wrist on his knee and rubbed it gently with his hand. He said accusingly, You got a husband. You got no call fooling around with other guys causing trouble. The girl flared up. Sure, I got a husband. Y'all seen him. Swell guy, ain't he? Spends all his time saying what he's going to do to guys he don't like, and he don't like nobody. Think I'm going to stay in that two-by-four house and listen how Curly's going to lead with his left twice and then bring in the old right cross? One, two, he says. Just the old one, two, and he'll go down. She paused, and her face lost its sullenness and grew interested. Say, what happened to Curly's hand? There was an embarrassed silence. Candy stole a look at Lenny. Then he coughed. Why, Curly, he got his hand caught in a machine, ma'am. Bust his hand. She watched for a moment. Then she laughed. Baloney. What you think you're selling me? Curly started something he didn't finish. Caught in a machine. Baloney. Why, he ain't give nobody the good old one, too, since he got his hand bust. Who bust him? Candy repeated sullenly. Got it caught in a machine. All right, she said contemptuously. All right, cover him up if you want to. What do I care? You bindle bums think you're so damn good. What do you think I am, kid? I tell you, I could have went with shows, not just one, neither. And the guy told me he could put me in pictures. She was breathless with indignation. Saturday night, everybody out doing something. Everybody. And what am I doing? Standing here talking to a bunch of bindle stiffs, a nigger and a dumb dumb and a lousy old sheep, and liking it because ain't nobody else. Lenny watched her, his mouth half open. Crooks had retired into the terrible protective dignity of the Negro. But a change came over old Candy. He stood up suddenly and knocked his nail keg over backward. I had enough, he said angrily. You ain't wanted here. We told you he ain't. And I tell you, you got floozy ideas about what us guys amounts to. You ain't got sense enough in that chicken head to even see that we ain't stiffs. 
Suppose you get us canned. Suppose you do. You think we'll hit the highway and look for another lousy two-bit job like this? You don't know that we got our own ranch to go to and our own house. We ain't got to stay here. We got a house and chickens and fruit trees and a place a hundred times prettier than this. And we got friends. That's what we got. Maybe there was a time when we was scared of getting canned, but we ain't no more. We got our own land, and it's ours, and we can go to it. Curly's wife laughed at him. Baloney, she said. I seen too many of you guys. If you had two bits in the world, why, you'd be in getting two shots of corn with it and sucking the bottom of the glass. I know you guys. Candy's face had grown redder and redder, but before she was done speaking, he had control of himself. He was the master of the situation. I might have knew, he said gently. Maybe you just better go along and roll your hoop. We ain't got nothing to say to you at all. We know what we got, and we don't care whether you know it or not. So maybe you better just scatter along now, because Curly maybe ain't going to like his wife out in the barn with us bindle stiffs. She looked from one face to another, and they were all closed against her. And she looked longest at Lenny until he dropped his eyes in embarrassment. Suddenly she said, Where'd you get them bruises on your face? Lenny looked up guiltily. Who? Me? Yeah, you. Lenny looked to Candy for help, and then he looked at his lap again. He got his hand caught in a machine, he said. Curly's wife laughed. Okay, machine. I'll talk to you later. I like machines. Candy broke in. You let this guy alone. Don't you do no messing around with him. Oh, tell George what you says. George won't have you messing with Lenny. Who's George? She asked. The little guy you come with? Lenny smiled happily. That's him, he said. That's the guy, and he's going to let me tend the rabbits. Well, if that's all you want, I might get a couple rabbits myself. Crook stood up from his bunk and faced her. I had enough, he said coldly. You got no rights coming in the colored man's room. You got no rights messing around in here at all. Now you just get out and get out quick. If you don't, I'm going to ask the boss not to ever let you come in the barn no more. She turned on him in scorn. Listen, nigger, she said, you know what I can do to you if you open your trap? Crook stared hopelessly at her, and then he sat down on his bunk and drew into himself. She closed on him. You know what I could do? Crook seemed to grow smaller, and he pressed himself against the wall. Yes, ma'am. Well, you keep your place in, nigger. I could get you strung up in a tree so easy it ain't even funny. Crooks had reduced himself to nothing. There was no personality, no ego, nothing to arouse either like or dislike. He said, Yes, ma'am. And his voice was toneless. For a moment she stood over him as though waiting for him to move so that she could whip at him again. But Crook sat perfectly still, his eyes averted, everything that might be hurt drawn in. She turned at last to the other two. Old Candy was watching her, fascinated. If you was to do that, we'd tell, he said quietly. We'd tell about you framing crooks. Tell and be damned, she cried. Nobody'd listen to you, and you know it. Nobody'd listen to you. 
Candy subsided. No, he agreed. Nobody listened to us. Lenny whined. I wish George was here. I wish George was here. Candy stepped over to him. Don't you worry, none, he said. I just heard the guys coming in. George will be in the bunkhouse right now, I bet. He turned to Curly's wife. You better go home now, he said quietly. If you go right now, we won't tell Curly he was here. She appraised him coolly. I ain't sure you heard nothing. Better not take no chances, he said. If you ain't sure, you better take the safe way. She turned to Lenny. I'm glad you bust up Curly a little bit. He got it coming to him. Sometimes I'd like to bust him myself. She slipped out the door and disappeared into the dark barn. And while she went through the barn, the halter chains rattled, and some horses snorted, and some stamped their feet. Crook seemed to come slowly out of the layers of protection he had put on. Was that the truth what you said about the guys come back? He asked. Sure. I heard them. Well, I didn't hear nothing. The gate banged, Candy said, and he went on. Jesus Christ, Curly's wife can move quiet. I guess she's had a lot of practice, though. Crooks avoided the whole subject now. Maybe you guys better go. He said, I ain't sure I want you in here no more. A colored man got to have some rights, even if he don't like them. Candy said, That bitch did not have said that to you. Well, nothing, Crook said dully. You guys coming in and sitting made me forget. What she says is true. The horses snorted out in the barn, and the chains rang, and a voice called, Lenny? Oh, Lenny, you in the barn? It's George, Lenny cried, and he answered, Here, George, I'm right in here. In a second, George stood framed in the door, and he looked disapprovingly about. What you doing in Crook's room? You had not to be in here. Crooks nodded. I told them, but they come in anyways. Well, why don't you kick them out? I didn't care much, said Crooks. Lenny's a nice fellow. Now Candy aroused himself. Oh, George, I've been figuring and figuring. I got it doped out how we can even make some money on them rabbits. George scowled. I thought I'd told you not to tell nobody about that. Candy was crestfallen. Didn't tell nobody but crooks. George said, Well, you guys get out of here. Jesus, seems like I can't go away for a minute. Candy and Lenny stood up and went toward the door. Crooks called, Candy. Huh? Remember what I said? about hoeing and doing odd jobs? Yeah, said Candy, I remember. Well, just forget it, said Crooks. I didn't mean it, just fooling. I wouldn't want to go no place like that. Well, okay, if you feel like that. Good night. The three men went out of the door. As they went through the barn, the horses snorted and the halter chains rattled. Crook sat on his bunk and looked at the door for a moment, and then he reached for the liniment bottle. He pulled out his shirt and back, poured a little liniment in his pink palm, and reaching around, he fell slowly to rubbing his back.
This ends disc three. Of Mice and Men. Disc four. One end of the great barn was piled high with new hay, and over the pile hung the four-taloned Jackson fork suspended from its pulley. The hay came down like a mountain slope to the other end of the barn, and there was a level place as yet unfilled with the new crop. At the sides the feeding racks were visible, and between the slats the heads of horses could be seen. It was Sunday afternoon. The resting horses nibbled the remaining wisps of hay, and they stamped their feet and they bit the wood of the mangers and rattled the halter chains. The afternoon sun sliced in through the cracks of the barn walls and lay in bright lines on the hay. There was the buzz of flies in the air, the lazy afternoon humming. From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the playing peg and the shouts of men playing, encouraging, jeering. But in the barn it was quiet and humming and lazy and warm. Only Lenny was in the barn, and Lenny sat in the hay beside a packing case under a manger in the end of the barn that hadn't been filled with hay. Lenny sat in the hay and looked at a little dead puppy that lay in front of him. Lenny looked at it for a long time, and then he put out his huge hand and stroked it, stroked it clear from one end to the other. And Lenny said softly to the puppy, why do you got to get killed? You ain't so little as mice. I didn't bounce you hard. He bent the pup's head up and looked in its face, and he said to it, Now maybe George ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits if he finds out you got killed. He scooped a little hollow and laid the puppy in it and covered it over with hay, out of sight. But he continued to stare at the mound he'd made. He said, This ain't no bad thing, like I gotta go hide in the brush. Oh, no, this ain't. I'll tell George. I found it dead. He unburied the puppy and inspected it and he stroked it from ears to tail. He went on sorrowfully. But he'll know. George always knows. He'll say, you done it. Don't try to put nothing over on me. And he'll say, now, just for that, you don't get to tend no rabbits. Suddenly his anger arose. God damn you, he cried. Why do you gotta get killed? You ain't so little as mice. He picked up the pup and hurled it from him. He turned his back on it. He sat bent over his knees and he whispered, Now I won't get to tend the rabbits. Now he won't let me. He rocked himself back and forth in his sorrow. From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the iron stake, and then a little chorus of cries. Lenny got up and brought the puppy back and laid it on the hay and sat down. He stroked the pup again. You wasn't big enough, he said. They told me and told me you wasn't. I didn't know you'd get killed so easy. He worked his fingers on the pup's limp ear. Maybe George won't care, he said. This here goddamn little son of a bitch wasn't nothing to George. Curly's wife came around the end of the last stall. She came very quietly so that Lenny didn't see her. She wore her bright cotton dress and the mules with the red ostrich feathers. Her face was made up, and little sausage curls were all in place. She was quite near to him before Lenny looked up and saw her. In a panic, he shoveled hay over the puppy with his fingers. 
He looked sullenly up at her. She said, What you got there, sonny boy? Lenny glared at her. George says I ain't to have nothing to do with you. Talk to you or nothing. She laughed. George giving you orders about everything? Then he looked down at the hay. Says I can't tend no rabbits if I talk to you or anything. She said quietly, He's scared. Curly will get mad. Well, Curly got his arm in a sling. And if Curly gets tough, you can break his other hand. You didn't put nothing over on me about getting it caught and no machine. But Lenny wasn't to be drawn. No, sir, I ain't gonna talk to you or nothing. She knelt in the hay beside him. Listen, she said. All the guys got a horseshoe tenement going on. It's only about four o'clock. None of them guys is going to leave that tenement. Why can't I talk to you? I never get to talk to nobody. I get awful lonely. Lenny said, Well, I ain't supposed to talk to you or nothing. I get lonely, she said. You can talk to people, but I can't talk to nobody but Curly, else he gets mad. How'd you like not to talk to anybody? Then he said, Well, I ain't supposed to. George is scared I'll get in trouble. She changed the subject. What you got covered up there? Then all of Lenny's woe came back on him. Just my pup, he said sadly. Just my little pup. And he swept the hay from on top of it. Why, he's dead, she cried. He was so little, said Lenny. I was just playing with him, and he made like he's going to bite me, and I made like I was going to smack him, and... And I done it, and then he was dead. She consoled him. Don't you worry none. He was just a mutt. You can get another one easy. The whole country is full of mutts. Oh, it ain't that so much, then he explained miserably. George ain't going to let me tend no rabbits now. Why don't he? Well, he said if I'd done any more bad things, he ain't going to let me tend the rabbits. She moved closer to him, and she spoke soothingly. Don't you worry about talking to me. Listen to the guys yell out there. They got four dollars bet in that tenement. None of them ain't going to leave till it's over. If George sees me talking to you, he'll give me hell, then he said cautiously. He told me so. Her face grew angry. What's the matter with me? She cried. Ain't I got a right to talk to nobody? What do they think I am anyways? You're a nice guy. I don't know why I can't talk to you. I ain't doing no harm to you. Well, George says you'll get us in a mess. Oh, nuts, she said. What kind of harm am I doing to you? Seem like they ain't none of them cares how I gotta live. Tell you I ain't used to living like this. I could have made something of myself, she said darkly. Maybe I will yet. And then her words tumbled out in a passion of communication, as though she hurried before her listener could be taken away. 
I lived right in Salinas. She said, come there when I was a kid. Well, a show come through, and I met one of the actors, and he said I could go with that show, but my old lady wouldn't let me. She says because I was only 15, but the guy says I coulda. If I'd went, I wouldn't be living like this, you bet. Lenny stroked the pup back and forth. We gonna have a little place. And rabbits, he explained. She went on with her story quickly, before she should be interrupted. Another time I met a guy, and he was in pictures. Went out to the Riverside Dance Palace with him. He says he was going to put me in the movies. Says I was a natural. As soon as he got back to Hollywood, he was going to write to me about it. She looked closely at Lenny to see whether she was impressing him. I never got that letter, she said. I always thought my old lady stole it. Well, I wasn't going to stay no place where I couldn't get nowhere or make something of myself and where they stole your letters. I asked her if she stole it, too, and she says no. So I married Curly. Met him out to the Riverside Dance Palace that same night. She demanded, You listening? Me? Sure. Well, I ain't told this to nobody before. Maybe I oughtn't to. I don't like Curly. He ain't a nice fella. And because she'd confided in him, she moved closer to Lenny and sat beside him. Could have been in the movies and had nice clothes. All them nice clothes like they wear. And I could have sat in them big hotels and had pictures took of me. When they had them previews, I could have went to them and spoke on the radio, and it wouldn't have cost me a cent because I was in the picture. And all them nice clothes like they wear because this guy says I was a natural. She looked up at Lenny, and she made a small, grand gesture with her arm and hand to show that she could act. The fingers trailed after her leading wrist, and her little finger stuck out grandly from the rest. Lenny sighed deeply. From outside came the clang of a horseshoe on metal and then a chorus of cheers. Somebody made a ringer, said Curly's wife. Now the light was lifting as the sun went down and the sun streaks climbed up the wall and fell over the feeding racks and over the heads of the horses. Lenny said, Maybe if I took this pup out and throwed him away, George would never know. And then I could tend the rabbits without no trouble. Curly's wife said angrily, Don't you think of nothing but rabbits? We're going to have a little place, Lenny explained patiently. We're going to have a house and a garden, and a place for alfalfa, and that alfalfa is for the rabbits, and I take a sack and get it all full of alfalfa, and then I take it to the rabbits. She asked, What makes you so nuts about rabbits? Lenny had to think carefully before he could come to a conclusion. He moved cautiously close to her until he was right against her, I like to pet nice things. Once at a fair, I seen some of them long hair rabbits, and they was nice, you bet. Sometimes I've even pet mice, but not when I could get nothing better. Curly's wife moved away from him a little. I think you're nuts, she said. No, I ain't. Lenny explained earnestly. George says I ain't. I like to pet nice things with my fingers. Soft things. She was a little bit reassured. Well, who don't? She said, everybody likes that. I like to feel silk and velvet. Do you like to feel velvet? Lenny chuckled with pleasure. 
<laughs> you bet, by God, he cried happily, and I had some, too. A lady give me some, and that lady was my own Aunt Clara. She give it right to me, about this big a piece. I wish I had that velvet right now. A frown came over his face. I lost it, he said. I ain't seen it for a long time. Curly's wife laughed at him. You're nuts, she said. But you're a kind of nice fella, just like a big baby. But a person can see kind of what you mean. When I'm doing my hair, sometimes I just set and stroke it because it's so soft. To show how she did it, she ran her fingers over the top of her head. Some people got kind of coarse hair, she said complacently. Take Curly. His hair is just like wire, but mine is soft and fine. Of course, I brush it a lot. That makes it fine. Here, feel right here. She took Lenny's hand and put it on her head. Feel right around there and see how soft it is. Lenny's big fingers fell to stroking her hair. Don't you muss it up, she said. Lenny said, Oh, that's nice. And he stroked harder. Oh, that's nice. Look out now. You'll muss it. And then she cried angrily, You stop it now. You mess it all up. She jerked her head sideways, and Lenny's fingers closed on her hair and hung on. Let go, she cried. You let go. Lenny was in a panic. His face was contorted. She screamed then, and Lenny's other hand closed over her mouth and nose. Please don't, he begged. Oh, please don't do that. George will be mad. She struggled violently under his hands. Her feet battered on the hay, and she writhed to be free, and from under Lenny's hand came a muffled screaming. Lenny began to cry with fright. Oh, please don't do none of that, he begged. George's gonna say I done a bad thing. He ain't gonna let me tin no rabbits. He moved his hand a little, and her hoarse cry came out. Then Lenny grew angry. Now don't, he said. I don't want you to yell. You're going to get me in trouble just like George says you will. Now don't you do that. And she continued to struggle, and her eyes were wild with terror. He shook her then, and he was angry with her. Don't you go yelling, he said. And he shook her, and her body flopped like a fish. And then she was still, for Lenny had broken her neck. He looked down at her, and carefully he removed his hand from over her mouth, and she lay still. I don't want to hurt you, he said, but George will be mad if you yell. When she didn't answer nor move, he bent closely over her. He lifted her arm and let it drop. For a moment he seemed bewildered, and then he whispered in fright, I done a bad thing. I done another bad thing. He pawed up the hay until it partly covered her. From outside the barn came a cry of men and the double clang of horseshoes on metal. For the first time, Lenny became conscious of the outside. He crouched down in the hay and listened. I done a real bad thing, he said. I shouldn't have did that. George would be mad, and... 
he said, and hide in the brush till he come. He's gonna be mad. In the brush till he come. That's what he said. Lenny went back and looked at the dead girl. The puppy lay close to her. Lenny picked it up. I'll throw him away, he said. It's bad enough like it is. He put the pup under his coat and he crept to the barn wall and peered out between the cracks toward the horseshoe game. And then he crept around the end of the last manger and disappeared. The sun streaks were high on the wall by now, and the light was growing soft in the barn. Curly's wife lay on her back, and she was half covered with hay. It was very quiet in the barn, and the quiet of the afternoon was on the ranch. Even the clang of the pitched shoes, even the voices of the men in the game seemed to grow more quiet. The air in the barn was dusky in advance of the outside day. A pigeon flew in through the open hay door and circled and flew out again. Around the last stall came a shepherd bitch, lean and long with heavy hanging dugs. Halfway to the packing box where the puppies were, she caught the dead scent of Curly's wife, and the hair rose along her spine. She whimpered and cringed to the packing box and jumped in among the puppies. Curly's wife lay with a half covering of yellow hay, and the meanness and the plannings and the discontent and the ache for attention were all gone from her face. She was very pretty and simple, and her face was sweet and young. Now her rouged cheeks and her reddened lips made her seem alive and sleeping very lightly. The curls, tiny little sausages, were spread on the hay behind her head, and her lips were parted. As happens sometimes, a moment settled and hovered and remained for much more than a moment, and sound stopped, and movement stopped for much, much more than a moment. Then, gradually, time awakened again, and moved sluggishly on. The horses stamped on the other side of the feeding racks, and the halter chains clinked. Outside, the men's voices became louder and clearer. From around the end of the last stall, old Candy's voice came. Lenny, he called. Oh, Lenny, you in here? I've been figuring some more. Tell you what we can do, Lenny. Old Candy appeared around the end of the last stall. Oh, Lenny, he called again, and then he stopped, and his body stiffened. He rubbed his smooth wrist on his white stubble whiskers. Well, I didn't know you was here, he said to Curly's wife. When she didn't answer, he stepped nearer. You oughtn't to sleep out here, he said disapprovingly. And then he was beside her, and, oh, Jesus Christ. He looked about helplessly, and he rubbed his beard. Then he jumped up and went quickly out of the barn. But the barn was alive now. The horses stamped and snorted, and they chewed the straw of their bedding, and they clashed the chains of their halters. In a moment, Candy came back, and George was with him. George said, What was it you wanted to see me about? Candy pointed at Curly's wife. George stared. What's the matter with her? He asked. He stepped closer, and then he echoed Candy's words. Oh, Jesus Christ. He was down on his knees beside her. He put his hand over her heart. And finally, when he stood up, slowly and stiffly, his face was as hard and tight as wood, and his eyes were hard. Candy said, What done it? George looked coldly at him. Ain't you got any idea? 
he asked, and Candy was silent. I should have knew, George said hopelessly. I guess maybe way back in my head I did. Candy asked, What are we going to do now, George? What are we going to do now? George was a long time in answering. Guess we got to tell the guys. I guess we got to get him and lock him up. We can't let him get away. Or the poor bastard would starve. And he tried to reassure himself. Maybe they'll lock him up and be nice to him. But Candy said excitedly, We ought to let him get away. You don't know that Curly. Curly's gonna want to get him lynched. Curly will get him killed. George watched Candy's lips. Yeah, he said at last. That's right, Curly will. And the other guys will. And he looked back at Curly's wife. Now Candy spoke his greatest fear. You and me can get that little place, can't we, George? You and me can go there and live nice, can't we, George? Can't we? Before George answered, Candy dropped his head and looked down at the hay. He knew. George said softly, I think I knowed from the very first. I think I knowed we'd never do her. I used to like to hear about it so much. I got to thinking maybe we would. Then it's all off, Candy asked sulkily. George didn't answer his question. George said, I'll work my month and I'll take my fifty bucks, and I'll stay all night in some lousy cat house, or I'll sit in some pool room till everybody goes home, and then I'll come back and work another month, and I'll have fifty bucks more. Candy said, He's such a nice fella. I didn't think he'd do nothing like this. George still stared at Curly's wife. And then he'd never done it in meanness, he said. All the time he'd done bad things, but he never done one of them mean. He straightened up and looked back at Candy. Now listen, we gonna tell the guys. They gotta bring him in, I guess. They ain't no way out. Maybe they won't hurt him, he said sharply. I ain't going to let him hurt, Lenny. Now, you listen. The guys might think I was in on it. I'm going to go into the bunkhouse. Then in a minute, you come out and tell the guys about her, and I'll come along and make like i never seen her. Will you do that? So the guys won't think I was in on it? Candy said, Sure, George. Sure, I'll do that. Okay. Give me a couple minutes, then. And you come running out and tell like you just found her. I'm going now. George turned and went quickly out of the barn. Old Candy watched him go. He looked helplessly back at Curly's wife, and gradually his sorrow and his anger grew into words. You goddamn tramp, he said viciously. You'd done it, didn't you? I suppose you're glad. Everybody knowed you'd mess things up. You wasn't no good. You ain't no good now, you lousy tort. He sniveled and his voice shook. I could have hoed in the garden and washed dishes for them guys. He paused and then went on in a sing-song, and he repeated the old words. If they was a circus or a baseball game, we would have went to her and just said to hell with work and went to her. Never asked nobody say so. And they'd have been a pig and chickens and in the winter 
the little fat stove and the rain coming and us just sitting there. His eyes blinded with tears and he turned and went weakly out of the barn and he rubbed his bristly whiskers with his wrist stump. Outside, the noise of the game stopped. There was a rise of voices in question, a drum of running feet, and the men burst into the barn, Slim and Carlson and young Whit and Curly, and Crooks keeping back out of attention range. Candy came after them, and last of all came George. George had put on his blue denim coat and buttoned it, and his black hat was pulled down low over his eyes. The men raced around the last stall. Their eyes found Curly's wife in the gloom. They stopped and stood still and looked. Then Slim went quietly over to her, and he felt her wrist. One lean finger touched her cheek, and then his hand went under her slightly twisted neck, and his fingers explored her neck. When he stood up, the men crowded near, and the spell was broken. Curly came suddenly to life. I know who done it, he cried. That big son of a bitch done it. I know he done it. Why, everybody else was out there playing horseshoes. He worked himself into a fury. I'm going to get him. I'm going for my shotgun. I'll kill the big son of a bitch myself. I'll shoot him in the guts. Come on, you guys. He ran furiously out of the barn. Carlson said, I'll get my Luger, and he ran out too. Slim turned quietly to George. I guess Lenny done it all right, he said. Her neck's bust. Lenny could have did that. George didn't answer, but he nodded slowly. His hat was so far down on his forehead that his eyes were covered. Slim went on, maybe like that time in weed you was telling about. Again, George nodded. Slim sighed. Well, I guess we got to get him. Where you think he might have went? It seemed to take George some time to free his words. He would have went south. He said, we come from north, so he would have went south. I guess we got to get him, Slim repeated. George stepped close. Couldn't we maybe bring him in and uh, lock him up? He's nuts, Slim. He never done this to be mean. Slim nodded. We might. He said, if we could keep Curly in, we might. But Curly's going to want to shoot him. Curly's still mad about his hand. And suppose they lock him up and strap him down and put him in a cage. That ain't no good, George. I know, said George. I know. Carlson came running in. The bastard stole my Luger, he shouted. It ain't in my bag. Curly followed him, and Curly carried a shotgun in his good hand. Curly was cold now. All right, you guys, he said. The nigger's got a shotgun. You take it, Carlson. When you see him, don't give him no chance. Shoot for his guts. That'll double him over. Whit said excitedly, Why, well, I ain't got a gun. Curly said, You go in Soledad and get a cop. Get Al Wiltz. He's deputy sheriff. Let's go now. He turned suspiciously on George. You're coming with us, fella. Yeah, said George. I'll come. But listen, Curly. The poor bastard's nuts. Don't shoot him. He didn't know what he was doing. Don't shoot him, Curly cried. He got Carlson's Luger. Of course we'll shoot him. George said weakly, 
Maybe Carlson lost his gun. I seen it this morning, said Carlson. No, it's been took. Slim stood looking down at Curly's wife. He said, Curly, maybe you better stay here with your wife. Curly's face reddened. I'm going. He said, I'm going to shoot the guts out of that big bastard myself. Even if I only got one hand, I'm going to get him. Slim turned to Candy. You stay here with him then, Candy. The rest of us better get going. They moved away. George stopped a moment beside Candy, and they both looked down at the dead girl until Curly called, You! George! You stick with us so we don't think you had nothing to do with this. George moved slowly after them, and his feet dragged heavily. When they were gone, Candy squatted down in the hay and watched the face of Curly's wife. Poor bastard, he said softly. The sound of the men grew fainter. The barn was darkening gradually, and in their stalls the horses shifted their feet and rattled the halter chains. Old Candy lay down in the hay and covered his eyes with his arm. The deep green pool of the Salinas River was still in the late afternoon. Already the sun had left the valley to go climbing up the slopes of the Gabilan Mountains, and the hilltops were rosy in the sun. But by the pool, among the mottled sycamores, a pleasant shade had fallen. A water snake glided smoothly up the pool, twisting its periscope head from side to side, and it swam the length of the pool and came to the legs of a motionless heron that stood in the shallows. A silent head and beak lanced down and plucked it out by the head, and the beak swallowed the little snake while its tail waved frantically. A far rush of wind sounded, and a gust drove through the tops of the trees like a wave. The sycamore leaves turned up their silver sides, the brown dry leaves on the ground scudded a few feet and row on row of tiny wind waves flowed up the pool's green surface. As quickly as it had come, the wind died, and the clearing was quiet again. The heron stood in the shallows, motionless and waiting. Another little water snake swam up the pool, turning its periscope head from side to side. Suddenly Lenny appeared out of the brush, and he came as silently as a creeping bear moves. The heron pounded the air with its wings, jacked itself clear of the water, and flew off downriver. The little snake slid in among the reeds at the pool's side. Lenny came quietly to the pool's edge. He knelt down and drank, barely touching his lips to the water. When a little bird skittered over the dry leaves behind him, his head jerked up and he strained toward the sound with eyes and ears until he saw the bird, and then he dropped his head and drank again. When he was finished, he sat down on the bank with his side to the pool so that he could watch the trail's entrance. He embraced his knees and laid his chin down on his knees. The light climbed on out of the valley, and as it went, the tops of the mountains seemed to blaze with increasing brightness. Lenny said softly, I didn't forget, you bet. God damn. Hide in the brush and wait for George. He pulled his hat down low over his eyes. George gonna give me hell, he said. George gonna wish he was alone and not have me bothering him. He turned his head and looked at the bright mountain tops. I can go right off there and find a cave, he said, and he continued sadly. And never have no ketchup, but I won't care. 
If George don't want me, I'll go away. I'll go away. And then from out of Lenny's head there came a little fat old woman. She wore thick bullseye glasses and she wore a huge gingham apron with pockets and she was starched and clean. She stood in front of Lenny and put her hands on her hips and she frowned disapprovingly at him. And when she spoke, it was in Lenny's voice. I told you and I told you, she said. I told you, mind George, cause he's such a nice fella and good to you. But you don't never take no care. You do bad things. And Lenny answered her. I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I tried and tried. I couldn't help it. You never give a thought to George, she went on in Lenny's voice. He'd been doing nice things for you all the time. When he got a piece of pie, you always got half or more than half. And if there was any ketchup, why, he'd give it all to you. I know, said Lenny miserably. I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am, I tried and tried. She interrupted him. All the time, he could have had such a good time if it wasn't for you. He would have took his pay and raised hell in a whorehouse, and he could have sat in a pool room and played snooker. But he got to take care of you. Lenny moaned with grief. I know, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I'll go right off in the hills, and I'll find a cave, and I'll live there so I won't be no more trouble to George. You just say that, she said sharply. You're always saying that, and you know, son of a bitching well, you ain't never going to do it. You'll just stick around and stew the bejesus out of George all the time. Then he said, I, I might just as well go away. George ain't going to let me tend no rabbits now. Aunt Clara was gone. And from out of Lenny's head there came a gigantic rabbit. It sat on its haunches in front of him, and it waggled its ears and crinkled its nose at him. And it spoke in Lenny's voice, too. Tinned rabbits, it said scornfully. You crazy bastard. You ain't fit to lick the boots of no rabbit. You'd forget them and let them go hungry, that's what you'd do. And then what would George think? I would not forget, Lenny said loudly. The hell you wouldn't, said the rabbit. You ain't worth a greased jack pin to ram you into hell. Christ knows George done everything he could to jack you out of the sewer, but it don't do no good. If you think George gonna let you ten rabbits, you're even crazier than usual. He ain't. He's gonna beat hell out of you with a stick. That's what he's gonna do. Now Lenny retorted belligerently, He ain't neither. George wouldn't do nothing like that. I know George since... I forget when. And he ain't never raised his hand to me with a stick. He's nice to me. He ain't gonna be mean. Well, he's sick of you, said the rabbit. He gonna beat the hell out of you and then go away and leave you. He won't. Then he cried frantically. He won't do nothing like that. I know, George. Me and him travels together. But the rabbit repeated softly over and over he gonna leave you, you crazy bastard. He gonna leave you all alone. He gonna leave you, crazy bastard. Lenny put his hands over his ears. He ain't, I tell you. He ain't. And he cried, Oh, George. 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 George came quietly out of the brush and the rabbit scuttled back into Lenny's brain. George said quietly, 
What the hell are you yelling about? Lenny got up on his knees. You ain't gonna leave me, are you, George? I know you ain't. George came stiffly near and sat down beside him. No. I knowed it. Then he cried, you ain't that kind. George was silent. Then he said, George? Yeah? I done another bad thing. It don't make no difference, George said, and he fell silent again. Only the topmost ridges were in the sun now. The shadow in the valley was blue and soft. From the distance came the sound of men shouting to one another. George turned his head and listened to the shouts. Then he said, George? Yeah? Ain't you gonna give me hell? Give me hell? Sure. Like you always done before. Like, if I didn't have you, I'd take my fifty bucks. Jesus Christ, Lenny. You can't remember nothing that happens. But you remember every word I say. Well, ain't you gonna say it? George shook himself. He said woodenly, If I was alone, I could live so easy. His voice was monotonous, had no emphasis. I could get a job and not have no mess. He stopped. Go on, said Lenny, and when the end of the month come, and... When the end of the month come, I could take my fifty bucks and go to a cat house. He stopped again. Lenny looked eagerly at him. Go on, George. Ain't you gonna give me no more hell? No, said George. Well, I can go away said Lenny. I'll go right off in the hills and find a cave if you don't want me. George shook himself again. No, he said, I want you to stay with me here. Lenny said craftily, Tell me like you done before. Tell you what? about the other guys and about us. George said, Guys like us got no family. They make a little steak and then they blow it in. They ain't got nobody in the world that gives a hoot in hell about them. But not us, Lenny cried happily. Tell about us now. George was quiet for a moment. But not us, he said. Because, because I got you, and, and I got you. We got each other, that's what, that gives a hoot in hell about us. Lenny cried in triumph. The little evening breeze blew over the clearing, and the leaves rustled and the wind waves flowed up the green pool. And the shouts of men sounded again, this time much closer than before. George took off his hat. He said shakily, Take off your hat, Lenny. The air feels fine. Lenny removed his hat dutifully and laid it on the ground in front of him. The shadow in the valley was bluer, and the evening came fast. On the wind, the sound of crashing in the brush came to them. Lenny said, 
tell how it's gonna be. George had been listening to the distant sounds. For a moment he was businesslike. Look across the river, Lenny. And I'll tell you so you can almost see it. Lenny turned his head and looked off across the pool and up the darkening slopes of the Gabalons. We gonna get a little place, George began. He reached in his side pocket and brought out Carlson's Luger. He snapped off the safety and the hand and gun lay on the ground behind Lenny's back. He looked at the back of Lenny's head, at the place where the spine and skull were joined. A man's voice called from up the river and another man answered. Go on, said Lenny. George raised the gun and his hand shook and he dropped his hand to the ground again. Go on, said Lenny. How's it gonna be? We gonna get a little place. We'll have a cow, said George, and we'll have maybe a pig and chickens. And down the flat, we'll have a little piece alfalfa. For the rabbits, Lenny shouted. For the rabbits, George repeated. And I get to tend the rabbits. And you get to tend the rabbits. Lenny giggled with happiness. And live on the fat of the land. Yes. Lenny turned his head. No, Lenny. Look down there across the river. Like you can almost see the place. Lenny obeyed him. George looked down at the gun. They were crashing footsteps in the brush now. George turned and looked toward them. Go on, George. When we gonna do it? Gonna do it soon. Me and you. You and me. Everybody gonna be nice to you. Ain't gonna be no more trouble. Nobody gonna hurt nobody, nor steal from them. Lenny said, I thought you was mad at me, George. No, said George. No, Lenny, I ain't mad. I never been mad, and I ain't now. That's a thing I want you to know. The voices came close now. George raised the gun and listened to the voices. Lenny begged, Let's do it now. Let's get that place now. Sure. Right now. I gotta. We gotta. And George raised the gun and steadied it and he brought the muzzle of it close to the back of Lenny's head. The hand shook violently, but his face set and his hand steadied. He pulled the trigger. The crash of the shot rolled up the hills and rolled down again. Lenny jarred and then settled slowly forward into the sand, and he lay without quivering. George shivered and looked at the gun, and then he threw it from him back up on the bank near the pile of old ashes. The brush seemed filled with cries and with the sound of running feet. Slim's voice shouted, George? Where you at, George? But George sat stiffly on the bank and looked at his right hand that had thrown the gun away. The group burst into the clearing and Curly was ahead. He saw Lenny lying on the sand. Got him by God. He went over and looked down at Lenny, and then he looked back at George. Right in the back of the head, he said softly. 
Slim came directly to George and sat down beside him, sat very close to him. Never you mind, said Slim. A guy got to sometimes. But Carlson was standing over George. How'd you do it? he asked. I had just done it, George said tiredly. Did he have my gun? Yeah, he had your gun. And you got it away from him and you took it and you killed him? Yeah, that's how. George's voice was almost a whisper. He looked steadily at his right hand that had held the gun. Slim twitched George's elbow. Come on, George. Me and you will go in and get a drink. George let himself be helped to his feet. Yeah, a drink. Slim said, You had a George. I swear you had a. Come on with me. He led George into the entrance of the trail and up toward the highway. Curly and Carlson looked after them. And Carlson said, Now what the hell you suppose is eating them two guys? The End You've been listening to Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck Narrated by Mark Hammer In Of Mice and Men, John Steinbeck experimented with a new form of fiction that he called the playable novel. He wrote in 1936, The work I am doing now is neither a novel or a play, but a kind of playable novel, written in novel form, but so seamed and set that it can be played as it stands. It wouldn't be like other plays, since it doesn't follow the formal acts, but uses chapters for curtains. Descriptions can be used for stage directions. Indeed, Of Mice and Men was presented as written the summer after its publication by the Theatre Union of San Francisco, although for the award-winning Broadway production, producer-playwright George S. Kaufman made extensive revisions. It won the New York Drama Critics Circle Award of 1937, beating out Thornton Wilder's Our Town and Clifford Odette's Golden Boy, and this, along with the film version released two years later, made John Steinbeck a household name. If you've enjoyed this book, Recorded Books recommends these other landmark writings of John Steinbeck. The Pearl, narrated by Frank Muller, Tortilla Flat, narrated by John McDonough, and The Moon is Down, written by Steinbeck as another experiment in the playable novel narrated by George Guidel. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalog, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So to order another Recorded Book, or for a copy of our latest listing, call us, toll-free, nationwide, at 1-800-638-1304. You can order by phone with any major credit card, or by writing to us, or by faxing us at 410-535-535. 5499. Don't forget to ask about easy 30 day rentals by mail. On our website, you can browse the catalog, hear about the latest releases, place orders, or tune into narrator profiles and author interviews. So visit